Welcome, everyone. Dr. Anthony Crinity IV here, also known as Dr. Finance. You're on a Dr. Finance Live podcast. We've got an incredible guest today. We've got Michael Lozier. Michael is an incredible author and speaker and expert in the, in the area of law of attraction. He has a, a famous book called The Law of Attraction, and supposedly it's sold over three, between three and four million. We're going to get the details on that in a little bit, copies. Uh, and then, of course, he's, he's doing amazing things on Clubhouse as well. So Welcome, Michael. How are you, sir? Hey, good afternoon. Good morning to you. I'm doing good. I'm excited. Uh, it's my favorite thing ever is to uh, uh, help people understand law of attraction better so they can be more deliberate about what they're attracting. So it's not by default, but it's deliberate. And that's why I call it deliberate attraction. You can do this deliberately. And uh, we'll get around to that today. Absolutely. Michael, before we get started, um, can we do a quick 30 second snapshot of your bio? And then we're going to get into your story and then we'll have about uh, 20 questions or give or take about a minute or two each. So that's the format for today. So maybe a 30 second snapshot of who you are. OK, well, uh, my name is Michael Loge and I live in beautiful Victoria, B.C. It's on an island on the west coast of Canada. I'm originally from the east coast and uh, my original training was around project management. And uh, so I was used to being uh, kind of on stage and training and teaching people. It really wasn't the subject. And I was growing up, I uh, remember attracting negative things and I never understood why. I thought, why would a nice person attract negative things? And then uh, when I started to research a little bit more and I found some really rare teachings about law of attraction, I said, that's what I needed to hear. That's why I was attracting negative things. And I took such an interest in that, that I started a discussion group in my little home <laughs> and I ended up having 44 people coming with cushions and lawn chairs to hear me talk about the subject of law of attraction. That was 22 years ago. It was such a foreign word. It was an underground subject and people that came kind of knew about law of attraction, but they didn't really know that it had a name. So, you know what, when you get 44 people come to your house, you've got to take lead of that. So, I was actually leading discussion groups and people would come back and say, hey, remember last week when you talked about this? So meanwhile, I'm keeping a binder of everybody's stories. Oh, I love when you said this and, and here's a copy of my desire statement and here's a copy of what I worked on and thank you notes. And you know, I had a big binder. So I was teaching law of attraction and I just wanted to be a trainer, that's all. I just wanted to be in front of the room and talk about law of attraction. I didn't know it was a career. I was still working for the government. And then I went to see a speaker. Remember, I live on an island. It was seven o'clock and I said, he's not going home. If you're on the island, it's seven o'clock, you're not getting off the island. So I said, hey, why don't I take you for a walk around Victoria? And I was a trainer, remember, not you know, more of a computer subject. Uh, and I said, boy, I would love to do what you do because he was like a speaker. And, and he said this most powerful sentence to me and I'll never forget him or the experience when he said, if you had a book, you could speak anywhere. Huh. You don't got to tell me twice. So I thought if I had a book and what I did have was a binder, an eight inch binder. And I came home and then I formatted everything. I, I was developing steps and processes and quotes. So I developed a workshop and I start doing a workshop in Victoria while I was working for the government. I remember charging $99 for a full day workshop and I had 10 people come. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I mean, I was working for the government. That was a great, that was a thousand dollars a day. Yeah. And then those people. So after about four months, I was getting a hundred people to come to, and people that already came, came back. I had like a following people were so thirsty for more information about law. It was nowhere in print. So I, so that's when I started to transition out of my government job. I went down to a four day work week and then Fridays became my law of attraction day. And I would go through the newspaper to find out meetings, you know, how there's business section, you know, the, the finance group is meeting at this hotel on Fridays. And I'd call them up and say, listen, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm writing a book and I'd love to come speak to your group. So my Fridays, I plugged it solid with going to breakfast meetings and lunch meetings. And, and then nobody knew I had another life working for the government. <laughs> to sum it up, I took the eight inch binder. I spent a year writing my book, Law of Attraction. Um, Meanwhile, I was doing teleconferencing calls. You might be too young to know about those, but they were like bridge lines when you get like a thousand people on. It's like Clubhouse without the, 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 the helpful app. So 
I was a guest on like network marketing and direct sales, three and 400 people. And I would go on talk about law of attraction. Remember 20 years ago, we didn't really have a website, but I had a website. It was called lawofattractionbook.com. And then during this call, I would say, because I talk fast, I would say, if you want the notes, the class notes, go to that page. And on that page, it said, and I, the first thing I did with my book was the cover. I had the cover done a year before I published the book. So during these conference calls, just what I do in Clubhouse, I said, if you want the class notes, go to this page. They would go to the, there was nothing on there. I remember 20 years ago, even to ask for somebody's email 20 years ago was pretty bold to do that. I had a picture of the book cover and it said, hey, do you want to be notified when it's published? Let me know. So I would get on these 300 person calls and I would get like tons. I get 200 emails at a time. It was crazy. And then people would ask me to be on their, you know, their um, calls and their group calls. Make a long story short. It's too late for that. It's already too long. You said 30 <laughs> seconds. So I published 5,000 books. I picked that up. I, and I, it was on it was COD. I, I think I did a deposit and I had a blank credit card. And I remember I was still working for the government. I had a blank credit card. This is going to be used to pay. I think it was like $6,000. My book was only like 97 cents. Not the hardcover, but the soft cover. So the printer said, hey, we're shipping your books. They're going to be there by Wednesday. I learned that on Friday. So on the weekend, I got the email together. I emailed all the people on the list. There was 5,000 of them, under 5,000. I emailed everybody on the list that, hey, the book is here. Thanks. And, you know, hope they're going to buy it. And I was charging $21.95. Wow. That's a, that's a lot of money. You know why I could charge that? I was the only book on the planet that had the word law of attraction in it. Now the publisher is selling it for like $9.99. <laughs> but the rarer the information, the more I could get for the book. So I woke up Monday morning and I turned on my computer and I thought I had a virus. It could, you got a new cell. You got a new cell. <laughs> and it was streaming like a ticker tape. And in two days, I sold every book every book that I, every, all 5,000 books. So now I got my friends together. We got boxes, we got markers. I would sign a book. Somebody would put it in an envelope and we put a, put a stamp on it. And that became a massive project, like 10 people. And then that's it. All the email stopped. I never heard because everybody that knew about the book bought it. And like we're, we're on day three and I thought, oh, I can't wait for people to get their books. And then people were, and they were emailing me. You know what they were saying? I'd like to buy more do you have a 10 pack? I thought, I got no packs. I didn't understand the book business. I wrote the book to be a speaker. And now that I sold out of my book, which I never planned to do, now people are saying, oh, can, can you ship? How much is in a box? And the questions were crazy. So that's what happened in my book. Rare information, uh, be helpful, give tools, give advice, give processes. People pay for a prop. This, is a, this isn't a love book. It's not stories about manifestation. This is the how-to and the processes. And um, there, so that's my story. And then, so I self-published. I sold a quarter of a million copies on my own. And then The Secret came out three years later. My book came out in 2003. The Secret came out in 2006. It was a world phenomena. Even, and in there, they used the word law of attraction. I'm the only book on the internet at the time with the word law of attraction. So my book went to number three. Number one was Harry Potter. Wasn't out yet, not fair, right? Wasn't even out yet, it was number one. Number two was The Secret. And number three was Michael Loge from Gilligan's Island. Nobody knew who I was. And uh, I stayed there for many weeks and I was in the book business. I was buying like 20,000 books and, and the, the printers were like, they were just overloaded. And we were ordering so many books we were ordering. And I didn't want to be in the book business. I wanted to be a speaker. And then I was having countries all over the world email me and say, can we speak to your foreign rights manager? And I'm thinking, what's that? I don't know what that means, right? But I was getting more and more emails. I've got like the fifth email. I thought, I think I'm going to start a spreadsheet. I don't know. Every, there seems to be a role called a foreign <laughs> rights manager. So I kept putting people off, honestly, because I wasn't overwhelmed. I just wanted to go on stage. And all of a sudden, I'm shipping and receiving and printing books. It was like just way beyond my interest. So I did a spreadsheet. After about a month, because other countries go to Amazon to find out what's hot. And I was number three and they thought, okay, if he's number three in the USA, he's gotta be hot over here. Uh, so anyway, I compiled a whole email list and I finally used law of attraction to say, I'd like to attract. 
an ideal person that can take this off my plate and do, and I did get a call from a, an agent in New York two days later. She introduced herself as Liza. She said, uh, we're trying to find you. We have a country that wants us to publish your book. And she said, that's what we do. And then I told her I had a list of 31 names. I think she fainted. <laughs> And she came back and she said, we'd like to be your agent. I thought I'd like you to be my agent. And within one week, she sold the rights to 31 countries. And now it's in 37 languages all around the world. Wow. That's amazing. And it started with a thought. <laughs> hey, I'd like to write a book. That's how it started. Thank you, Michael. So, Michael, that was, yeah, definitely a long 30 seconds. Uh, so in maybe two sentences, can you summarize yourself? Like if, if you had to tell someone what? what it is that you do can you break it down in two or three you mean like business wise what what i do yeah yeah well do you know how you hear about people that keep attracting negative things over and over and over again and they don't know why well what i do is that i help people understand what they're doing that's causing them to attract negative things so they can stop attracting what they don't want and start attracting what they do want that's beautiful thank you michael all right, Michael, we're going to jump back into your story. We're, we'll start from uh, childhood. So you were, you were originally from east coast of Canada? Yeah, north of Maine on the eastern coast. So oh, wow. Kind of a, a forest, forestry industry family. Yeah. And, and what was it like growing over there? No, no wonder I see you on your Instagram. You got pictures eating lobsters. I'm like, wait a minute. That's, that's yeah, that's very, that's very east coast. Everything's lobster on the east coast. There's none on the west coast, as you know, right? So yeah. if I have a lobster, it was flown in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I grew up, I, I was kind of isolated. I had a, a sister uh, seven years older and another sister seven years younger. And guess what? You don't hang out with your sisters when they're that. So I kind of grew up on my own and I was very creative. And uh, I, I, you know, I remember being interested in like art projects and you know, figuring out puzzles and all that stuff. And I also know that I like to be alone. If that makes any sense. I didn't need a lot of people around me. It wasn't that I wasn't friendly. Uh, and I also experienced being bullied because of my body size. I was, I was fat when I was a kid. So, and I think that's when it all started for me because when I was bullied, it never made sense. It would have been like, how can I, why am I attracting bullies? I'm such a nice guy. You know, I'm young. I'm thinking, well, you know, I was, I was going to church every Sunday. I mean, I had all these justifications. Like, why would I attract negative things? I'm a nice guy. I'm my mother's favorite. Why am I attracting negative things? But then I start to see the pattern between being nervous about being bullied and being bullied. And when, when I caught myself, same with anybody listening, when you catch yourself saying, this is exactly what I said I didn't want to have happen. So when you say, I don't want this to happen, you're actually giving it attention. So I kind of learned that maybe after a while. So then whenever I was thinking about being bullied, I was thinking, well, no, there's my friend, Anthony. He's always nice to me. He's my good friend. So I learned that if I focused on, I didn't know what it's called in these terms, when I, when I reset my attention to something that I liked, then my vibe changed. And then when my vibe changed, I wasn't attracting the negative things. So that's kind of my childhood, kind of by myself, wasn't very social, was bullied a bit, understood the process. And even at an early age, I understood about positive thinking and I end up being the guy that people would come to. Even when I worked for the government, people would come in my office and they would come to me for private coaching because their life sucked or something like that. And I would reset their vibe privately. Nobody knew I was doing law of attraction in my government office. So I had the history of being the positive guy, the guy that people went to. And so that's how it started. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate that. So, so Michael, um, what maybe one or two stories growing up your first 10 years what, uh, what was uh what was it like growing up over there was there was there lobster farms or like what, what were you guys doing over there okay well good question my dad was a laborer and he worked at a pulp mill because you know they, it's a forestry province it's like a state it's a forestry province they grow trees then they have the pulp mill that makes the newsprint and then they have the news it's all one so that's what my dad worked at labor is that uh and yeah, because the international, have, sorry to interrupt, the international paper, I believe their headquarters is up there somewhere, right? Probably, yeah, it's a mass, Irving uh, is the conglomerate, they, they grow the trees, they pulp the trees, they print the newsprint, and then they print the newspaper, right? <laughs> and then boxes and other stuff, so, but they're also great reforesters, you know, they, re, they plant as many trees as they cut down, it's an industry there, it's not like they go, in, where I live, they clear cut and they don't replant in the west coast, but there it's an industry. So you're always seeing tree planting. It's, it's very interesting. 
Uh, we had a summer home, so we didn't travel. You know, when you, when you have a summer home, you don't stay in, so we never stayed in hotels. We never ate at restaurants. I remember we'd leave our house and my mother would have a Tupperware container, the old Tupperware with her name on it. And it would have sandwich and that was our lunch. We didn't stop for coffee. We didn't do that that many years ago. We would leave our house. It was three hours to get to the cottage. You had to pee in a cup and that was it. You were eating lunch. <laughs> and then we got there and we had a, a nice little summer home with no, nobody near us. And it was clams. We would dig clams in the water. And then lobster dock was maybe four or five blocks away. So I grew up oh. lobster. Listen, my parents both grew up in lobster and they would take lobster sandwiches to school and they were embarrassed. So they would eat them with nobody watching them. They would be made fun of because they were having lobster sandwiches. Yeah, that's back in the day, lobster was kind of like eating like cockroaches, right? Like, yeah, it, like the it didn't become the a delicatessen until much later. Yeah. yeah. So we grew up in lobsters and clams and um, yeah, so that was my childhood. And then as I grew up to be an adult, a hotel was a massive big deal to me, not to mention a restaurant. So when I got to travel the world 17 times and stay in five diamond hotels, wow. sometimes I never left the hotel. <laughs> I would get to the hotel. And I remember going to this one hotel in Singapore and there was like 12 pillows all on the bed. And I thought that's a bit much. And then there was a little card on the pillows. You know what it was? Wait for it. It was a pillow menu. <laughs> And it showed all the shapes of the pillow and then what kind they were, foam or feather. So you could pick your feather with the pillow. Pen. You could pick That's the pillow funny. with the pillow menu. And I thought, okay, I've landed. I get, I get to choose my pillow at this hotel. <laughs> That's, That's really incredible. I like that story. So, so Michael, uh, when did you eventually move over to the West Coast of Canada? Was that uh, much later? Yeah, I was about 25 years old. I graduated. Uh, and I worked in the same industry in the office. I, you know, I, was, I wasn't blue collar, I was white collar. I worked in the office of the shipbuilding company where they made big Navy vessels because uh, it was on the coast. And I got headhunted, you know, to the government here in Victoria bought the same software, this shipyard was, and they needed an expert. So of course, and I, I knew where Victoria was, but I knew it was on an island and that's all I knew. So I came out for a year and I never left, and that was 30 years ago. Wow. Yeah, so. Your family's still back in the East Coast? Yeah, everyone's still on the East Coast, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So uh, you're, you're, uh, you're, you're living your own dreams. You, you've kind of all of attraction, you've attracted to the place of your desire. Yeah, and even recently I was thinking, you know, not really second guessing, because, you know, all my family, I've got two sisters and a brother and my mom, and, you know, I go back and visit them, and sometimes I'm thinking, if I had stayed there, I wouldn't have had the life that I had, right? It's like, so sometimes you got to pull away and do something different than your family. And, but, you know, my sister was my assistant for 12 years, right? So she, I was talking to her every day. And, and then when I was doing a lot of uh, seminars, my mom and my sister would come to New York and Phoenix, and I did a law of attraction crew. So I would create opportunities to hang out with them. But um, yeah, I had to, I had to do something different. And if you look at the whole family tree, I'm the only one that doesn't live there out of, out of everybody. So, wow. Well, yeah. that's, I mean, that's really courageous. Um, but that's the part of being an, entre uh, an entrepreneur, taking yeah. a, taking a risk. So yeah. Michael, um, maybe we can talk about your, your business journeys before you got into this. You already mentioned it a little bit, but so you moved to the West coast, you took on a new job. Um, and then how, how what, what was your jobs from that point until, where you finally got to the full-time trans transition. Yeah, well, I moved to Victoria and uh, to work for the government that was installing the software. So I was a trainer. I was training people how to use the computer and how to do this. So I was used to being in front of the room. Uh, and then probably five years in, I took a personal development course and which was new to me. I was still young. I was maybe like 30 or 32 or something. And that really changed for me. And I, I learned how I could use a lot of these things that I was learning when I was doing my training in school, or sorry, at the government. So, um, uh, and then I started to volunteer. So this seminar company came to Victoria once a month and I said, oh, I wanna volunteer. So I did that every once a month. So I was doing everything, working at the doors, to doing name tags, to taking breaks, to assisting the seminar leader. So I was in that energy and it ran my clockwork. 
So I got all of my training about being an awesome seminar leader because I used accelerated learning techniques by watching and observing hundreds of seminars that I was a volunteer at. So it became natural. Uh, and then, uh, and even when I was teaching law of attraction in my living room, I stood up, I didn't sit in a chair. I stood up and I facilitated it. And I, I always was imagining that even if I go to a place and there was three people, I still stood up and I would still have somebody introduce me. I just did, it was part of, and I said, well, we know you. And I said, I still want you to introduce me. You know, it was all part of the, it was all part of the process and the, the, I want to say pomp and circumstances, like just how to be a professional speaker, get introduced, engage the audience, stay in the front of the room. And I did hundreds of those here in Victoria, you know, kind of building my career while I was working for the government. So, so you, you got, uh, you, you pretty much were warmed up being a part of the seminar organization before you launched on your own. You got to learn the daily uh, business yeah. of seminars from watching a, a successful company first. Yes. And then you took incorporated those practices and applied it to your own business when the time exactly. was right. Yes. And even the things that I learned at the government, because, you know, they sent me on Word and Excel and project manager, all that, all of that was in alignment to what I'm doing today. Like to be a project manager means it's like planning a wedding. You got to work backwards. So my entire career was planning seminars and events. So I used my project management to back up and say, okay, we want to do something in, in two weeks. Here's all the things that need to happen. I didn't know that was a skill set. I thought everybody knew how to do that. It's not true. Some people would be thinking, wow, were you ever good at that? I thought, oh. and that's when I kind of learned that not everybody understood the process of managing a project. So um, yeah, so again, all these things that I learned and I served the government really well when I was there and they served me and the seminar company, I was their star <laughs> and now they refer to me a lot, but I use a lot of techniques that I learned that everything from the name tags to getting people in, engaging people, putting people into groups, all of that. So everything that I was doing was in alignment to what I'm doing right now. And if it wasn't in alignment, I would feel it thinking, why am I taking this plumber's course anyway? This doesn't feel right. Not that I would, but <laughs> using that little vibrational indicator to say, am I on track here? Or am I doing something that's not going to fit to what I want? So. Thank you, Michael. So Michael, we're eventually going to get into questions. And a lot of these questions will tie into things related to what we just talked about, the books. There's a question on um, law of attraction, things like that. So just yep. to wrap up your story, take it from that moment to present. Is there any other um, stories or pieces of information you want to uh, include to give the audience uh, an indication of how you became successful? Maybe there was key moments, other moments you haven't mentioned. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I'd be remiss if I didn't say everything was because of law of attraction, you know, and law of attraction is existing for everybody all the time. But if you can be deliberate to exercise it, you can attract things. Now, I have a history in Victoria because remember, it's a small island. So I'd have a lot of people see me over and over and over again and bring out their friends and probably hundreds of seminars or presentations. I would say this to the audience. I get them all excited and say, hey, say yes, if Oprah's going to love me. And they would say, yes. And I would say something, say, say yes, is Oprah going to love that too? So it was always a conversation about Oprah's going to love having a conversation with me. But I never really talked, you know, talked about wanting to be on TV. I didn't know what it was. And I was like, oh, I, want, I didn't really want to be on the Oprah's couch, to be honest with you. But I wanted to have a conversation with her, maybe in the garden, like she did with Mangle Mark, you know, uh, how those things, I'd, I'd do that. And I said all the time, Oprah's going to love this. Oprah's going to love this. And then one time I said, I'd like to be Michael Mondays because Dr. Phil was Dr. Phil Tuesdays. And I thought, well, if Dr. Phil can have a day, I can have a day too. And as a producer, isn't it easy to have the same guest once a week instead of having, right? So I thought, so that was my idea. I said, say yes, if I'd, be, I'd, I'd make a good Michael Monday on Oprah. So I'm always having this conversation and people are getting on board. So then, so I wrote my book in 2003. I sold a quarter of a million copies on my own. Remember, I was doing these conference calls and so on. And then The Secret came out in 2006. And then, uh, then that was the big hoopla. Everybody, everybody heard about it. They were quite inspired. Uh, and then in 2009, Oprah interviewed the people from The Secret. And this is my opinion, not hers. It was a disaster. They, there was four people on stools and they were contradicting each other. And honestly, they were all upselling to their product. I don't even know how that, and I have no idea why that show aired because it wasn't the style. They were actually talking about their programs and their processes and didn't answer the question. 
And I remember watching that interview uh, in a hotel in Vancouver and my book was number 176 on Amazon. That's pretty good for a self-published author from Gilligan's Island to be one number 176. So I was hustling it. So I'm getting ready to go to the sem I'm, I'm in Vancouver doing a seminar. Seminar starts at six. Oprah's on between four and five. I'm watching her talk to people in the secret and Oprah's mentioning the word law of attraction at least five times. <laughs> and how many books are on the internet with the word law of attraction on it? One. So the, sh the sh and I, during the show, I was pressing refresh and it was one, it wasn't refreshing. It was one number 176. And then I did research and it said, you know, Amazon updates at the top of the hour. And I thought, okay, I'm going to wait till five o'clock when the show's over. So my friend sends me a message says, hey, I'm downstairs. And I said, I need like five minutes. So I'm pressing refresh and refresh and the Oprah show's over. I'm pretty excited because she said law of attraction, not the word. She didn't make from the word secret. That is awesome. So I pressed one, I pressed the refresh and I lost my 176. So I scrolled down. So now 160s and 150s and I'm scrolling. And, and, now, and now I'm thinking I went the wrong way. I don't I keep going. Yeah, you had to sell books. When Oprah said law of attraction, there's no other way. I'm scrolling and now I'm like in the top 50 and 40. Now, now I'm scrolling back and forth thinking I missed it and I'm going lower and lower. And I went to number nine. I went from 176 to number nine. Oh, I was so proud of myself. Wow. Wow. I printed off the top 10 on the Amazon chart and I took it to the seminar with me and I was bragging. Oh, hey, number nine, everybody look, I'm number nine. So the big joke, I made it to number nine. And I thought, you know what? I'll talk about that for the rest of my life. I made it to number nine. So I came back from the seminar and, uh, you know, I don't even think I had a phone at the time. Back from the seminar, I go back on my laptop and I press and I lost the number nine spot. So I thought, oh, and then I look at the bottom and I went to number three. So I went from number nine to number three, and I stayed there for almost two months. So you went from 176 to three in, in like less than a few hours. Because of Oprah, yes. That is incredible. Yes. And you know, my book's done really well. It's a classic. You know, I, I published it in 2003. I sold the rights to an American publisher in 2006. I wasn't going to, but I was deep into the book business and I didn't want to be <laughs> like really. Uh, and then, um, yeah, I think that was the story. There's a lesson here, another lesson. I mean, a lesson on preparedness. So, I mean, you were prepared. You were ready. You were ready, even though you weren't sure it was going to happen. You, yeah. you, you were ready for this. Like, any thoughts on that for entrepreneurs to be prepared? Well, you know, everything, here's two of my secrets. I rarely do anything alone. You know, I like to do things together with people, particularly first time things. You know? I like to co-host something. I like the energy of two people. So that, so that was a big deal for me. But I would make things happen. So, oh, I wonder if there's a group here in Law of Attraction. No, there's not, then start one. Like I, I don't look for things to happen. I make them happen, you know? It's like, oh, I'd like to do more talks in Victoria and make it happen. And I would go to people's living rooms with three people. And I would say, you're going to read my bio and I'm going to stay. Abby, you're my best friend. I don't care. We're playing seminar today and I'm the seminar leader. <laughs> so I'd go to their, I'd go with three people and they would say, oh boy, I wish you'd come to my workplace. And I said, well, if you can get four or five people, I'll go. And that's how I did it. And before I know I was going to workplaces, I created everything. There was nothing outside me that it did it to me or everything I created. And even if I would advertise a seminar and nobody registered, it didn't matter. I just kept doing it. So that, that's that's incredible, Michael. I, I was actually reminded of a, a story. I, I believe it was it might have been Sharon Lecter, my mentor, who told me when she went on Oprah, and uh, Oprah came back. <laughs> <laughs> you okay? Okay. Okay. Yeah, Michael. So. Uh, she, she went on over with Kiyosaki, her, her uh, co-author of Rich Dad Poor Dad. And I think she said something like Oprah after the end came back to her and said something like, I think that's good for at least a million copies. <laughs> you know, like, so the, 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 the uh, magic of Oprah, I mean, I've had so many people on this, sh this show that were either co-actors with her, like Julian Britano or, um, you know, uh, Jean Chatsky was her number one um, finance, person, finance yeah. expert for three years. Like they were on the show and, and, and all of them seem to indicate that like, once you get on that show, there's something about Oprah, she's got this power. Even Tim story was saying like the, 
the touch of Oprah. Like once you're connected to her, it's like the, the Midas touch, everything turns to gold and you just kind of proved it in a few hours. I mean, that's, yeah, that's incredible. Well, it's interesting. A lot of people get a lot of fame if they're on the Oprah TV, but I didn't want to be on the Oprah TV for a couple of reasons. One of them being that I didn't want to be exposed to 25 million people and have 20 million haters. I didn't want that. So I never vibed that I wanted to be on the couch, you know, and plus my body was big and I didn't, I didn't want people. Oh my God. I didn't want all the chit chat. I just wanted to talk with Oprah. So after The Secret came out and they were interviewed on Oprah in 2009, two days later, my sister emails me and she says, hey, listen, guess who called? You know, well, don't play that game with me. Guess who called? She said, we got a call from an Oprah producer that uh, is looking at, at this, this is interpretation. They're trying to find someone that knows about law of attraction because of the mess of the show before. Nobody said that. That's in my head. And we noticed that Michael has his book. When we're asking around and people are saying Michael Loge's book and we don't even know how to find you because remember I'm a self-published author and Gilligan's Island, they can't find me. They said, can you ship us a book overnight? My sister said, assistant said, yes. Is it and really called next, Gilligan's Island? No, I call it that. It's, <laughs> okay. that, it's Vancouver <laughs> Island, but Gilligan's Island, you're too young to know about Gilligan's Island. Oh, maybe. I remember that growing up. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was a show that I just make fun of it. So then my, my assistant sister calls me the next day. She said, don't ever guess what? We got another call from another producer at the Oprah show wanting a copy of the book. I want to send them another copy. And I'm not even kidding. The third day, my sister assistant calls me and said, we got another call from a producer at the Oprah show that wants to send a copy of the book. So here's the background. It cost $109 to send a book to Chicago. So we're spending like $300. I didn't care at this point. You just do what you got to do but just the notion that three. And then on Friday, we got a call from the head producer apologizing because three producers were on this problem and they didn't know that all three were trying to solve it. So anyway, they end up buying a box of books or getting a box of books. Uh, and then a week later, we got a call and said, Oprah loves your book, it's in her purse. Uh, you know what I want to say? Can someone get a picture of that, please? <laughs> I'd love to get a picture of my book hanging outside Oprah's beach oh, bag, wow. I'll tell you that. <laughs> and she said, Oprah wants to interview you for on a radio show, um, The Soul Series, which aired on Sunday for the week, right? Uh, on, on XM Radio. So I flew from Victoria to Vancouver because I'm on an island and I needed to be in an uh, uh, XM satellite radio station, TV radio station rather. So I get to Vancouver. I'm pretty excited. A uh, lot of staff, it was at CBC uh, radio station in Vancouver. A lot of staff was excited. Oprah was going to be on the air. I was on the other side of the booth. Uh, I, it was no pre-chat with Oprah. It was just got right onto the call. And I had a half hour interview with Oprah and she loved it. She was quoting from my book. You know, it's like when someone, when Oprah says, hey, and I'll, I'll quote her exactly. In my book at the end of each section, it says, here's what you should have learned in this section. And it bullets all the things, because I'm a trainer, this is a book, it's not a love story. So Oprah said, I love this. And she, Oprah said, I love how you said this. And then she was reading everything. And I'm like, oh my God, Oprah, she really read my book. She quoted it many times. So that was it, the interview was over. And you know, when an interview is over, it's over, there's no chit chat and hung up. And this was in March. So it wasn't super cold in Vancouver, but I did have a big winter jacket on and I zipped it up. And, because I took the float plane over, I had a little knapsack and I buckled that all up and I put a hat on and the producer taps on the glass and he said, put the headset on, it's Oprah. So I thought, oh, she came back to say hello, right? Mm -hmm. So I put the headset on, on top of the hat, on top of the jacket with the buckled up knapsack. And here's what I heard. I heard the jingle music and Oprah says, boy, we loved him last week. We brought him back for a second interview. So meanwhile, I'm at my second interview with Oprah, fully dressed, and my assistant friend was there. You know, on an application, it says, and related duties. You know what my friend's related duty was? <laughs> Wiping the sweat off of my forehead <laughs> while I'm being interviewed by Oprah for the second time, fully dressed. I couldn't unbuckle all that stuff. Oprah, can you hold on? Hashtag, you don't do that. So that was two 25-minute interviews. We were done, and I left. Two weeks later, I'm flying, I'm in Australia. I'm doing like 30, maybe 30 days in Australia, New Zealand. My sister calls me again. Oh, she's a pain in the you know what. She said, Oprah loved your interview and wants to know 
if you could do a call-in show. Now, before the Oprah, I had a, a radio show on um, um, Voice America. What a good practice ground. Remember I said practice, practice, practice. I didn't pop out of nowhere. I practiced on Voice America and I bombed and I got better. So when, I, when it came to Oprah, I was polished and she knew that. She said, uh, she wants to know if you want to do a call-in show uh, and here's the date and time. I guess it wasn't, would you? Here's the date and time. So the date and time in Australia was three in the morning. So, I mean, there's no, there's no expense spared with the Oprah network, right? So they actually opened up a radio station, an XM radio station style in Australia. And I go at three in the morning with my team there. The station's packed, all the staff, because Oprah's gonna be in the house, it was a big deal. And before the interview, the producer came on and said, Oprah wants to know if you wanna know the questions you're gonna be asked. And I said, absolutely not. So she was pretty impressed with that. So I did a 25 minute interview with live callers and she's quoting from the book and she's talking about my clarity through contrast worksheet. And as soon as that ended at the end, she said, uh, the producer came back and she said, the phone lines are lit up like a Jerry Lewis telethon. Do you, that's my own joke, isn't it funny? <laughs> so he said, do you wanna do another half hour? It's like, well, don't ask. So I end up having four 25 minute interviews. So remember earlier, I said, I wanted to be Michael Monday. Oh, I was Michael Monday. I was on the uh, Oprah and Friends Soul series four times a day for a month. Wow. And my ratings went through the roof from that interview. And then I got this invitation to join the Oprah and Friends crew. You said, a, look at the people here. Well, first, here's Michael Loge from Gilligan's Island. But Gail Schultz, uh, not Gail Schultz, but Gail, Oprah, Maya Angelou, Dr. Oz, the Peets, Gene Chatsky, Dr. Schmuller, I think that's his name, and Michael Loche from Gilligan's Island. So talk about one of these things don't match with the other. Now, what's different is I wasn't represented on TV, which was my vibration. I love this. If I had been on TV, I could say, yeah, I was on the Oprah show once, and then a big deal. Now look what I can say. I was interviewed four times. I had my own radio station show on this station for a year. Michael, I have, I have a question. Yep. Like, obviously, you're super successful, you know, in, in all you've done. There's a, there's a theory on momentum, though, and I, I had this discussion with um, a very successful entrepreneur here, here uh, Ryan Blair, talking about um, you have to, have to really have, you know, take advantage of the momentum. If you, you know, you, you said you had some, some issues with going on TV at that time, but if you had to go back now with all your experiences, would you go back and, and recapture that momentum to get on the show? And, and the second follow-up question, sorry to machine gun them to you, but yeah. do you think that that would have really skyrocketed your brand if you would have got on TV and, and went that route like a Dr. Oz? It, it would have, but I didn't want that. I, I didn't want that. Even being in Victoria, when I came out with the book, I was on TV a lot and Canadian TV. Uh -huh. And, you know, it takes away some privacy and I, I don't, I, you know, I, we all think it's fun, but I just, I just, I didn't need that. I didn't want that. Mm. If I had to do it again, oh yes, I've got all the tools now. You know, I'm, I'm more fit. I'm doing different stuff. I would just, shut. if someone said, can you be on Oprah in a month? I would shut it down in my house and wow. I would hire a team of people to get fat ass in good shape. My everything I would look at. Yeah, I would, I would plow through though. I would plow through the resistance that I wouldn't have done years ago. And you think that that like once, see, once you miss that momentum, would you agree? Like it, it's hard to go back on there now because it's not, the force is not there. Like the energy went a different direction. It was 20 years ago. Like could, you think uh, well, not with that, not with that subject, but you know what? My third book called your life's purpose. Uh -huh. This is a hot subject right now. You know, people, you know, people are, are not fulfilled. You know, do you know how you hear about people that talk about they're not fulfilled at work and they thought they thought it was going to be the ideal job and they get in, they're still not fulfilled. Well, what I do is that I help people uncover what fulfills them. So law of attraction, a, a tool for everybody, but fulfillment, whether it's about relationships or a job or a new career. So there's still an opportunity for Oprah and I to hang out <laughs> because we haven't talked about this and we haven't talked about my ability to release negative emotions. Wait till she finds out about that. But my well, style is the unfoldment of all of that. That's the fun part. When things start to unfold that are in alignment. And just by having this conversation with you today, I'm including the vibration of it. This is a guy from my book. This is the vibrational bubble. Doesn't look like you or I, but it's an indicator of the vibe. 
When I talk about something, that's my vibe. When I think about it, when I pretend, when I remember, when I complain, when I worry, all of it's part of my vibe. And law of attraction is always eavesdropping on this vibe and it's matching it. It's not very smart, but it's obedient. You know, when I worked for the government, I had a 17 page job description. Here's, I'm gonna show you the two, the, the job description for law of attraction is two words long, they're in red. Match vibrations, positive or negative. So if you're complaining and sending a negative vibe, law of attraction does, it's smart, it's obedient. And then it starts to unfold and orchestrate to bring you more of what you said you didn't want. Wow, it's a third client that canceled today. What's going on? All my clients are canceling. Law of attraction can't buck that current. It can only match it. Whatever we're receiving had had to been a vibration at first. Thank so you, Michael. That was br brilliant response. Thank you. And, and by the way, folks, uh, we actually, we've already met on Clubhouse a while ago, but uh, we decided to connect at a moment based on this law of attraction thing last Friday. You mind if I tell the story, Michael? No, go ahead. <laughs> okay. So we're on, on Clubhouse. Every Friday night, I, I host a room for about a year and a half now, have uh, big superstars on. And um, this Friday, I had Bob Bodine on. And at the end of the night, it was usually this when the magic happens, the last like hour, half hour. A few of the people on, on stage in the community are like, you know, uh, oh, I, I'm sorry. I started, I was like, let's try something new. And I, and I uh, started calling a few names out. I'm like, guys, can you come off your mic and call these names out with me? I, I, I have this theory that they might show up one day. And we did. We called a few names. Then we got to Oprah. And someone was like, hey, you know, did you interview Michael Lozier? I'm like, no, I didn't. He was in the room today. He was driving. He didn't want to come on the stage. He was, he was busy. Um, but I didn't interview him. And, and then every, all of a sudden, everybody else started chiming in. You got to interview him. He's, he's doing incredible things. So then me and Michael started talking offline the next day. Yeah. And here it is, just a few days later. And, and Michael, I, I really think eventually if, if Oprah ever comes, she was already on Clubhouse, but if she comes into our room, um, like, yeah, definitely, definitely let you know. So maybe that would be the next, the next step for you. <laughs> you know, connecting you and stuff, reconnecting you. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm open to that, you know. Um, it, you know, the, the speed at which we attract anything isn't determined in how much we want it. It's determined on how much doubt we have in receiving it. And the thing, that's, the thing that creates our doubt is our, is our evidence, you know? Oh, I said, and I'm doubting myself, right? So what if you remove the doubt? I just want to show you, um, you know, it's, it's the doubt that's always receiving it. So if we, you could hold the vibration that Oprah is going to somehow want to appear or participate or contribute to something that's important to her, then we need to remove the doubt that that's possible, right? Mm. So oh, that'll never happen. You say, oh, you know what? She's in media. She's a media wizard. She knows and understands platform. This would be cool and group. Like just create a different story around that. So thank you, Michael. All right, Michael, two more uh, questions about your story, and then we'll get into the regular questions. So you want to tell us a little bit about what, what it's like uh, hanging out in Victoria. What, what's, what's Victoria, British Columbia like? Oh, it is beautiful. Victoria, British Columbia is called Canada's Garden City. So it's north of Seattle and it doesn't snow here. I'll say it again. Well, it snows one day and then it melts the same day. So uh, it's very Victorian because Canada is ruled by the Queen. So it's Queen Victoria, named after Queen Victoria. And it's uh, very, very, I can show you a quick picture if you want to see the style. Sure. It's, it's very old buildings. Here. Does it rain a lot like Seattle? Yes. So this is an example of the Victorian oh, style buildings. There's a big cruise ship in today. And then you can see that parliament building with the roof. So Victoria is the capital city of the province. Oops. And it's also the home of old growth forest. So Within 20 minutes from here, there's trees that are a thousand years old that wouldn't even fit in this room. They're so they're so huge. So, and uh, that's that's where I like to go. It's cold there though. It's cold in the woods, and there's no life. There's no there's no plants. There's no animals. It's it's not very friendly because there's no light or sun can get to it. But it's a big beautiful canopy walking through the woods, and that's you, my style. You said after seven o'clock you can't get off the island. Kind of reminds me of Staten Island in New York a little bit. Yeah, I think the last ferry is at seven or a little later than that. So, and you have to travel by ferry or plane, but ferry from Vancouver or a ferry to Seattle. So we're right 
we're really close to both. The ferry right. to Seattle is only like an hour away. Really? So, yeah, we're really close. Wow. Um, yeah, I, I almost had a chance to visit there when I was in Vancouver at one time, because uh, you're saying it's only, it's not, it's not too far of a ferry ride from me. It's a ferry ride, yeah, an hour and a half from Vancouver. What do you like to do for fun, Michael? Hmm, what do I like to do for fun? That's always a challenging question to me, and I'll tell you why, because fun is not a value to me. <laughs> no, I can say that honestly, it's not my value. My values are influencing people in a positive way, freedom, and intimacy. In other words, intimate conversations. This is fun for me. Learning and talking to people and understanding how I can help them and how they can help me. And let's build a goal. Let me help you get there. Help me. Get... That's fun for me. So it's not hiking and sports and cars and all that stuff. What's fun for me is creation and development. And I don't call it fun, but I'm super into it. So, <laughs> but, but I won't resist the word fun if you need to hear it. That's fun for me. Creating and developing things with people. That's awesome. Thank you, Michael. All right, Michael, we're going to move into our questions now. So um, we've got about, let's say, 20 questions, give or take. Sure. And um, a lot of them have to do with what you already talked about. So we'll, we'll kind of do a summary. So, for example, can we do a quick overview of your books? So you have three major books. I don't believe you have any other books. Can you tell us about those and okay. uh, maybe go one by one? Maybe That's about two right. minutes. Thank you for letting me do that. So in my book, Law of, um, Law of Attraction, it teaches you how to change your vibe. So when you change your vibe, you change your results. The star of my book, Law of Attraction, is this guy. And it's all about what is the vibe that I'm sending because the vibe that I'm sending is getting matched. So I, in that book, I teach people how to be deliberate. How can I deliberately send the vibration of something I want? That's Law of Attraction. My next book is called Law of Connection. And just like it suggests, is that there is rules or laws that help us connect with other people. And that book summarizes the four different ways people like to receive information. This person here, they like to feel it and do it. This person here likes to see it. This person here likes to think about it. This person here likes to hear it. So my book law of connection, and you can also do an assessment to find out your style, teaches people that there's four ways that people like to receive information. And are you breaking rapport with people because you're trying to deliver it in a way they don't get it? So this is good if you're anybody, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a parent, you have employees. If you're asking your employee a question and you're not matching their style, it'll hit resistance. For example, if someone says, how, do you, how does that make you feel? And that's not their word. They'll, like, you, you know how you use the word fun for me? It caused resistance because it's not my word. If you, because I'm visual. So if you had a said, tell me what you see yourself doing, you know, what, what, tell me, now draw me a picture of what you like to do. I could answer it like that. So, book number two, there's four styles. Find out which style is your most dominant and which style is your most weakest. Now, that book came about because my publisher said, Michael, people, they thought my feedback on my book was a little odd. People were commenting on my style. So oh, I really like your style, you know, because I've got worksheets and check off things and I've got, and what they were liking is that I was teaching my book to all four styles. So people, oh, I like the pictures. I like the worksheets. Oh, I like the story about Betty. Oh, I like the symbols that you use. I like the graphics. So I satisfied all four styles. And I told my um, publisher, I said, well, there's a reason why I do that. It's called, you know, it's my NLP training. So then I wrote this book on how to satisfy all four of these styles in coaching and writing and training. And then my last book was something that I did one-on-one -on -one with people. I would sit with them and I would meet with them and I would help them uncover what fulfills them. And I don't mean uh, what the job title is, but what fulfills them. And in my book, I'll just... Let me find a page here. So in my book, um, I have a list of 30 fulfillment needs. They start with attention, achievement, fun, freedom, control. There's, there's 30 of them, right? So in this book, it walks you through the process. So at the end of the process, you'll surface the top four. And now when I make decisions, when you said, hey, Michael, would you like to come on my, my clubhouse? Would you like to come on my blog? Would you like to come on my YouTube? I use, I use my top four fulfillment needs to say whether I would be fulfilled or not. Does that make sense? Like, oh, I'd love to do that. 
Sometimes we don't know why we love to do that. Well, the reason why you love to do that is because you're getting fulfilled. So uncover what really fulfills you. So I'm gonna tell you my top four fulfillment needs and you tell me if I got them met today. Fulfillment need number one, attention. Did I get attention or attentiveness today? Certainly are. Am Certainly will. Get, <laughs> am I gonna get it on your 1000 person clubhouse? Sure. You bet. That's, that's my value, attention. Next one uh, is influencing people in a positive way. Did I get that met today? I would say so. I would say so too. Sure. So, so far I'm getting my attentiveness means that's why I'm a trainer and a speaker. I love that attentiveness. I'm getting attentive to me needs met. I'm getting um, um, influencing people in a positive way. My third one is intimacy. And it's spelled this way, into hyphen me hyphen C. So what does that mean? I wanna know into you. I don't know, I don't wanna know about your cars and your sports and your weather, doesn't matter to me. I want to know intimate conversation. What's your goals? What's your dreams? What's your blockage? How can I support you? How can you show, like very intimate personal conversations? I'm getting that met today. And the fourth one is freedom. So when I have an offer and it includes all four of those, I said, I'm in, I'll be fulfilled. It's like a fulfillment meter. It's something that measures fulfillment for me. And imagine everybody understanding what fulfills them so you can make decisions based on that. I'm, go ahead. No, that's great. Thank you, Michael. I think we're going to collaborate a lot. <laughs> yes. Now, now that now you understand what tick, makes me tick, thank you. <laughs> All right, Michael, that's a brilliant response. Any other points about your books that you want to talk about? I mean, you sold so many copies. Yeah. Actually, you know what? Let's do the next question. How, do you, how did you sell over three million books i think close to four million i, I want to know it from the from the business side this is the business side of you which i think yeah. is brilliant okay well i have i have i have lots of reasons i'm going to answer them i don't have a list but here's what i do know all three of my books were seminars first and when you do a seminar it causes you to do processes i got to do this first and do this first so and people pay for processes this is the three-step process for attracting what you want. This is the four-step process for uncovering people's style. And this is the five-step process for uncovering what fulfills you. So all of my books were seminars first that I mastered. I delivered them many times. And then I'd peek over somebody's shoulder and think, why are they doing that? And then I'd find out, oh, you didn't tell me what to do. So that's how I mastered. And all three of the books, I never had to make a change in 20 years. I never made a change to this book because I did it well the first time. Wow. So number one, they were all seminars first. Number two is that I developed a signature presentation from each one of those. So when I'm on Clubhouse, my, my book law of attraction is divided into two sections. The first section, you can have it for free. It's 17 pages long. I talk about it every time. The rest of the pages is the processes. So for all of my books, I do a signature presentation that introduces people to the service product and gives a tool away. The freebie in here, because it's, remember it's a signature presentation, is people's ability to reset their vibe. So imagine coming to a presentation on, and more than it, it's a training. I'm a trainer, I'm not a motivational speaker, but I'm a motivated trainer. So with Law of Attraction, you'll, you'll leave with the tool that you can reset your vibe. And then there's the processes if you want more. Same with law of connection. Same with your life purpose. I have signature presentations for each one of those, which means I can deliver that, give people a good tool, and then they're going to want more. I also did, this was, this was the days of Google Hangouts before Facebook Live. I did 400 Facebook, Google, uh, Google Live uh, for 400 Fridays. Wow. And this was behind me every time. 400 Fridays you did. I have, I have 400 YouTube videos uh -huh. on this book. And I plucked one thing and made it a whole show. Wow. How long and, was the show? Uh, they were about 40 minutes, 45 minutes. Yeah. I stopped doing those because I, you know, kind of ran out of the material. But I do a face. Uh, and now for the last three years, I've been doing a show on releasing negative emotions for people. 
And we did that uh, every, every Saturday. Now we do it once a month. Hey, but I also wanted to show you this, this sign goes me with every, everywhere. And you're thinking, well, isn't that cumbersome to carry that sign? You know what it is? It's a shower curtain. Oh. <laughs> Watch see. this. It'll move. Yeah. It's just a printed. So I would take this to trade shows. I would take it to events. There's a little pole up above it. It yes. folds up into a little napkin this size. I take it out of my suitcase. I get it's, it's and listen, it's waterproof because who cares? But it's it's the fabric that doesn't get wrinkly. So this is my marketing right here. And also the name of my show was called Hang Out with Michael. So good branding. I love it. Yeah. And, so you, and I you also have... built I also built my career by being a professional radio guest. So I would I, I, I would be on talk radio shows. This is early in the days when uh -huh. they only did talk radio. I would do like four or five interviews a week. At one time I was in a magazine for talk radio guests. And I was and, the, and then every time I was on there, I was always driving traffic to this and to the book. And that's how you sell books. You know, as you know, oh, writing the book isn't the hard part. Right? Yeah. It's hard. It's not the hard part. Yeah. It's just beginning. <laughs> yeah. So four to five interviews a week you would do. That, that was your formula for radio, right? That's right. And so, then I had a reputation with a few radio hosts that I'm a, I'm a good emergency last minute. My guest just canceled and I'm screwed. And they would, they would say, dude, can you come on like four? I would be doing anything. I'd say, yeah, four minutes. So I, so I had that reputation, particularly there was a, a radio, Frankie Boyer out of Boston. She called me a lot. She said, I need a guest. And I said, okay. And I'd hear her and I'd, I should be on her phone and I would hear the commercial. I say, when? She says, in two minutes. And I said, I can do it. So, and of course, being on anybody's radio show was helpful. Just curious. Um, I don't know if you have numbers like that you want to share. Uh, like a, a typical radio show, how many, how many books do you usually sell? Well, now I, now I can't tell because I don't sell my own books. You know, the publisher huh. does. But there would be a time um, that I could sell, you know, because I did sell them on Amazon. I never sold them myself because I live on Gilligan's Island. So it, was, it didn't make sense. <laughs> Matter of fact, here's a little story. When I wrote my book, I went to the post office and I said, how thick it, can a book be before it doesn't fit in the, the regular envelope? And you know how thick it is? This thick. Wow. So I wrote all three of my books to be this thick, 144 pages, because at that time you had to pay extra to mail it. And I didn't want to pay $10 to mail a book. So I, I was able to make it sure it fit in the mail slot. <laughs> but I, I, I couldn't tell when I was, um, when I was doing the, the 300 person calls, like for network marketing companies, uh -huh. I could sell a hundred books within probably 10 minutes, excuse me, and then 200 overnight. So and it's the kind of book people don't share. It's like, hey, I'm done. With, no one's done with it. No one says I'm done with this. And because it has worksheets in it, some people fill it out. So people tend not to give away their books. They'll, they'll encourage people to buy it. That's brilliant. Yeah, it was well thought out, Michael. I, I got to commend you. Like you, you. And there's a lot of other tricks, I'm sure, that uh, you, know, you kept in the vault. But um, to sell those kind of books, that, that, that's, uh, that's amazing. And I know, you, you know we could say Oprah helped out and stuff, but no, not really. Yeah, I, you I wouldn't. Did it, you attracted yeah, I wouldn't. Get it. I did. Yeah. And here's another thing that's consistent with my books is all of them have worksheets. So when I'm talking about these subjects, I say, hey, go download the worksheets here. Or go, to, go take the free assessment here. Go download the list. So now it's bringing traffic to my website and now they're downloading the list or taking the assessment. And then they're, they're getting to like me more. And in this business, this is super important. No like and trust. So I'm doing a clubhouse, I'm telling, you know, the clubhouse event, I changed my little profile picture for our friends that know that, and I changed them to these, you know, change your vibe, change your results. And so what do you want? And, uh, and why I do that is because I'm a trainer and I want to burn the image. I want to make sure people get it. So these tools here, I call them buttons, is all they are is photographs. And then I put them on a book. So. I probably have 5,000 people that have downloaded these. And these are key training elements. You know, I have a certification training program. I've trained 470 people in 17 countries. This is, they learn this training point, this training point, this. So these are key training. They're just not little cute graphics. They're purposeful. After so, they're trained, what do they do, Michael? Uh, they're able to teach your stuff? Well, what, yes, they do. But they learn how to do the signature presentation. And that's using accelerated learning techniques. 
meaning getting 100% of the audience participating. Usually it's a free presentation to upsell to the processes. Or when I travel, people would pay me to do the free presentation and not free, of course. So they learn how to do that presentation and then they learn and then I'll just, and then there's a, there's, there's a 17 page workbook and then they learn how to facilitate the seminar using the worksheets. Oh, okay. So it's like a turnkey system for people that want to teach how to apply law of attraction. Thank you, Michael. You're welcome. Brilliant, brilliant response. Michael, next question, and you've already said it before, but I'd love to maybe get a quick summary. How, how does it feel to be interviewed by Oprah four times? I mean, that's incredible. I heard, I heard the interview, by the way. It was, what, what an interview. Yeah. Well, she was I, really I, into it. She was really into oh, it. She was totally into it. Yeah. <laughs> Complimenting me and telling her own stories. And she was interrupting me and I was interrupting her. And it was just a nice flow. I wasn't starstruck at all. I, I could tell it was her voice interview when I was on the radio, but I was pretty focused. I'm, I'm, I got a lot of confidence, you know, and my little voices, and I'm not new. Like I've interviewed lots of people. I have, 500 live shows I had I mean I was always on the radio I understood about sound bites little quickie things little tips little tools so uh yeah I, I again I don't I don't process a lot with feelings but um it was exciting for me and I love talking about it and it was a great experience for me thank you Michael Michael next question you already showed it before but if we can focus on it a little bit more. Who, who are all the others that were on Oprah and Friends? Now, you have this great CD, and you mentioned some of their names, but I really want to slow that down because it went real fast because I don't think yeah. the people know, the audience knows exactly who these people are. Like right. Gene Chansky is just huge in finance, financial yeah. expert. Like they're all huge names. Dr. Yeah. Oz, I think, is one of them. Well, uh, it, this was on XM Radio. It was called Oprah and Friends, uh -huh. and these were all hosts. So the, these are the only hosts they had, and they played in rotation, right? So, uh, you know, maybe Dr. Oz, or if everybody did a show for an hour or long, it would, they could make it last a day. So some people were weekly, mine was weekly, some people were daily. I think um, the Pete's here, they were on daily. So uh, yeah, so there's some pretty famous people here. Uh, you can see there's Maya Angelou who since passed away. There's Gail King. Uh, I think one of these women is Jean. I can't really tell too well. I think this is Jean. Yeah, I think. Uh, this is the, um, the guy that does um, purging and stuff. These are the Pete's. This is Nick, Nick, um, uh, the designer. And that's Robert is, Green to the left of her. That's her physical trainer, I think, the guy who helped her lose weight. Oh, yeah, that's right here, Dr. Oz. And this is Reverend Schmuley, I think his name, and then me. So all of these people also had a TV presence. So they were recruited after Oprah said, hey, I've got a radio show. So I came in much later. I was only on for a year. These guys were probably on for the whole length of the XM radio. This doesn't exist anymore. It shut down the XM studio. So there, there was 13 people total, right? That's right. And who, so, who produced that cover? Was that Oprah, that company produced that? Yeah, it was Harpo Studios. This, this record, the, the radio station is right across from the big TV thing, the TV station. And uh, it was it was a very you know it was a big staff. It was a beautiful booth inside. And as soon as you walk into the lobby, there was a massive oil painting of Oprah uh, in, the, in the beautiful lobby. That was beautiful. And uh, I remember they they gave me an Oprah mug, and I kept my I still have my Oprah mug too. Uh, it was good. The staff loved me. I was I was pretty friendly, and I was easy to get along with. And I would bring them gifts from Vancouver Island. So like. Uh, they knew I was different and they would tell me little secret squirrely things too. You know, they, you know, just to be nice to me and make sure that I was finding my way with stuff. So they were a great team. And I went to Chicago for the first six months. I would go and I would stay at the Omni Suites Hotel like they do on TV. Guests of the Oprah Winfrey stay at the Omni Suites Hotel. That was me. So I would go arrive. I would stay overnight. I would go to the studio. And I would record four shows for the month and then fly back to Vancouver. Big deal, Vancouver to Chicago. I still did it. So here's the story about the Omni Suites Hotel. I'm probably like into three months. So remember the secret squirrely friend? So I went back to the uh, studio and one of the women said, are you enjoying the restaurant at the Omni Suites Hotel? I said, restaurant? 
I said, I'm going to Subway across the street to get a sandwich. <laughs> she said, oh no, you're on Oprah's account. Whatever, you, you can go for body work, you can order for room service, you can do whatever you want. Said, oh, I did not know that. <laughs> I didn't abuse it, but I did get room service when I learned about that little Omni Sweets trick. So that was good for me. Did you make friends with any of those other people on there? Like Robert Greene's one of the world leaders in, in physical training, I think. For yeah. Them. No, I didn't. I, I, I saw some of them physically when I went to the studio, but nobody talked to me. I didn't talk to anybody. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's, a, that's an incredible story. I mean, just to be amongst the superstars like that on that, yeah. that CD, every one of them became famous in their own way. That's it's, right. It's, and, and the actual studio, I have a picture. I'm going to post it if I can find it. You know, the studio with the glass with everybody. You have. The actual interview room, it, it was concave of beautifulness. It wasn't like a, it wasn't like you and I studio. It was sofas and beautiful floral rain. Like it was really well. That's our headquarters in Chicago. You're the headquarters in the Chicago, in the radio station. The interview room was just beautiful and it was padded and beautiful flowers and sofas. Like it, it was meant for her, you know, she come in and sit down and have an interview. So she has a house in Vancouver too, I think, right? Like a mansion. Uh, I'm not sure. Probably. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, well, thank you, Michael. Appreciate that. Uh, brilliant, brilliant story. All right. So we're going to get into some technical questions now. Uh, this is your uh, cup of tea, I guess. So what, can we just start from ground zero? What is the law of attraction? Now, before you answer that question, we've had a lot of people from the seeker on the show, I think about six or seven, Joe, Dr. Joe Vitale, also uh, a big law of attraction guy started breaking a lot of these questions down. I'd love to hear your, your viewpoint. What is this actual law of attraction? Well, here's my approach to that. And telling you what it is, here's what I'd like to do for you and for our friends listening. I'm gonna give, give you six words and I want you to give yourself a point if you've ever used them, even people listening at home. So the first one is the word coincidence. I'm gonna give myself a point. I bet you use that word too. Same with people listening, coincidence. The next word is synchronicity. Oh, I think I've used that. How about serendipity? Okay, I've used that. How about fate? Karma, meant to be. Everything fell into place. It was kismet. So we use all of these words, and I know that you've used them if you're listening. Hey, this is such a coincidence. I was just thinking about you. It was so serendipitous. I went to this coffee shop I never went to, and I met my ideal client customer there. It was synchronicity. It was fate. It was karma. That list of words is used to describe evidence of law of attraction. So when you say, hey, this is such a coincidence, evidence of law of attraction. Or when you said you wanted something like you did the other day and it shows up, say, wow, this is such a coincidence. I was just talking about Oprah. That's evidence of law of attraction. The point that I'm making is you're already experiencing it. If you've ever used the word fate or karma or synchronistic serendipity, if you've used those words in that very moment, you could say, this is so law of attraction. I was just thinking about you. My point is you're already experiencing it. And now you can learn how to do it deliberately. What if you could deliberately have more synchronistic serendipity, fate, karma, meant to be moments? So first, law of attraction is energy around us and I can't prove it to anybody. I'd love to put it in a Petri dish or a test tube and say, hey, here's law of attraction. Do you believe me now? It's not my job. I'm not trying to convince anybody. But as I know that people have had that experience where they've attracted something that they, they want. Hey, this is exactly what I want. But what people aren't noticing is that when they attract something negative, it's because of the same reason. So in my book, Law of Attraction, the superstar is the vibrational bubble guy. It's not you or I, it's anybody. And this, this vibe around us, so if I'm angry and ticked off and feeling guilt and shame and blame, if I'm having those emotions, that's my vibe. And if I'm feeling appreciation and love and I'm having those positive experience, that's my vibe. And you cannot not have one. Right now, we have a positive vibe or a negative vibe. There's not one in the middle. So while we're having that vibe, that means I'm giving attention to something that I like or don't like. While I'm having that vibe, law of attraction is eavesdropping on my vibe and matching it, whether it's positive or negative. What's, See, what's law, the exact definition, Michael, of, of uh, law of attraction? You can say it in one sentence. Law of attraction is? Law of attraction matches vibrations, positive or negative. 
and a vibration is our vibe. And right now we have one. So law of attraction is checking and checking and checking and checking and checking. And it's responding to that vibe by giving you more of the same. It's not smart. Now let's talk about some of our friends. Maybe they work up Monday morning and a client cancels. and said, no, no, what's my vibe? Oh, I hate when clients cancel. I just had a client cancel. It drives me crazy and on and on and on. And then they go on clubhouse and start a room saying, don't you hate when clients cancel? And now your entire vibration is about counseling clients and law of attraction isn't very smart. It's obedient. And now it starts to unfold and orchestrate to bring you more client cancel. They say, what's going on? It's the third one today. You're on a roll, all right. You're on a negative vibration rule. And the rule is simple. If you attracted it, you had to have sent the vibration that created it. It's not my rule. That is the law. But the best news of all is that we have the ability to reset the vibe. So what if I was able to reset my vibe and now I'm sending a new vibe and law of attraction is a smart, it doesn't know what the vibe used to be. It only knows what the vibe is right now. And what if the vibe I'm sending is something that I do want? It's all about our vibes. And if you're curious, you and everybody thinking, well, I wonder what the vibes are I'm sending about money. Well, I can tell you from here. If you're curious and you want to know what the vibe is you're sending about money, open your wallet. It's a perfect match. Do you want to know the vibe that you're sending about attracting customers or clients? How's your new customer and client acquisition file folder coming? If you've received it, it's evidence of the input. It's like Google. Whatever you're receiving from Google, match the input that you gave it. Google's not very smart. It's obedient. Google doesn't know whether you want it or don't want it. It's obedient. If I go to Google and type in no pink elephants, Google's gonna show me pink elephants. It strips the way the words don't, not, and no. And now it brought me what I said I didn't want because it's not smart, it's obedient. So the same with our own lives. I have to be careful not to talk about what I don't want. If I'm complaining and worrying and talking about what I don't want, I just gave it attention. And as I give anything attention, law of attraction unfolds and orchestrates to bring me more of it. Talk about having to be deliberate. So you have to mind your vibration. And I'm going to show you the three reasons why we attract, why we send a negative vibe. We don't mean to. You don't have to be a negative person to send. Oprah's not negative, but she attracted negative things. I'm not a negative person. How do negative people, how, how do positive people attract negative things? Hey, listen, if you're taking notes, everybody, here's the most three important words for you to know today. The words don't, not, and no. Matter of fact, burn the image, burn it, burn it, look at it, look at it, look at it. <laughs> Whenever I use the word don't, not, and no, I just include it what I didn't want to include. So when I say, don't forget, I just gave attention to forgetting. How about this? Don't hesitate to contact me. What did I give attention to? Hesitation. Don't drink and drive. Don't do drugs. Don't smoke. Don't beat up your brother. Don't spill your milk. Don't be disappointed. Don't be ashamed. This is not a scam. Every time I say what it's not, I included it. Go to Google and type in no football, see what shows up. You think you're gonna get hockey? No, you're gonna get football. Google strips the way the words don't, not, and no and brings you what you said you didn't want. And law of attraction is vibrational Google. So as you talk about the things that you don't want, you included the vibration of what you don't want. And then law of attraction brings you what you, and then we'll point at it and say, that's exactly what I didn't want. I've been saying all week I didn't want that. And the law of attraction had a voice of, ooh, was I ever good? I unfolded and orchestrate to bring you what you said you didn't want because I'm not smart. I'm obedient. Michael, can I pause it here for a second? Yep. So one of the things you had said uh, a few lines back was that like you, you're hinted that you're not really here to, to prove it to anybody. But as a scientist, I think that it can be proved. Um, I, I operate in the framework of finance and economics. They're social sciences. And I argued this in my first book, The Necessity of Finance. Like, we don't have a laboratory in social sciences. I, I can't put the things that we teach of finance in, in a lab and yeah. do like, uh, you know, all those kind of tests. It's not the same thing. Maybe the law of attraction can be the same way. For example, just look at the stage on Friday night. We had 50, about 55, 60 people in the room at the end of the night yeah. when I brought those names up. I gave attention to Oprah and a few other names. And every time I said the name, people would say their name, right? And here we go. We got to the point where it was Oprah and Michael L Lozier was recommended. So we got 50-something people in the, in the room. I mean, 
isn't there a poss isn't there a way if we done this over a series of time that we start just drawing using statistics to prove that this can keep happening through copying events like that or surveys you could my whole life i could have all those experiences but it doesn't prove it and it doesn't make people believe it now dr joe dispenza he is the guy to explain this i i have one page in my book because i'm not interested in the science behind it with all due respect my job is to teach you how to apply it deliberately so I don't talk about molecules. I don't even understand any of that stuff. But I, people say, I'm the how-to guy. Thank you very much, Oprah Winfrey, for calling me that. I'm the how-to guy for teaching it. Do you need to understand how to do it? No, you just need to know the formula. So it's a good question. Uh, and I couldn't even try to explain. Could I give you a thousand and one examples? Yes. Will it make you believe it more? No. Maybe not you, but the skeptics. It wouldn't make them believe oh yeah, you know what they'd say? That's just a coincidence. And I would say, yes, it is a coincidence. <laughs> and then that, that, that trips them up. Thank you, it is a coincidence. It's evidence of law of attraction. And that puts them in a little stunned loop a little bit. Thank you, Michael, appreciate that. All right, Michael, so I wanna step back on law of attraction. I know that you do have expertise in this. I, I didn't read that part of your book, but from what Oprah was saying um, in that conversation with you, you, you would have expertise in it. What is the history of the law of attraction? And I believe in your first book, you actually went back and you started throwing history at Atkinson and names and going yes. back 100 years ago. Can you, can you walk a, us through that? Yeah, that was a big job for me because a couple of things about me, you know, I graduated in high school 30 years ago and I've read nine books in 30 years. So I don't read books. I don't go to people's seminars. Um, I don't listen to other people's training, not for any reason that I'm, I just like to keep the purity, my own my own my own my own purity on, on how i do different things i forgot the question i was i was getting to the answer the, the history of law of attraction thank you yeah so what i understood was my own experience i was being bullied and what i was bullied is because i was worried about being bullied so i got that and then when i found out so when i heard that and then around 1991 i heard the expression law of attraction and it piqued my ears and i was in seattle i was at a seminar i heard someone say law of attraction I never heard that before, even though Brian Tracy had written about it, I learned that afterwards, it never spoke to me. And I thought, law of attraction, what does this word law mean? And then I learned the most important sentence that the law says it matches vibrations, whether negative or positive. And then I thought, well, that's why I would attract negative things. And then it made so much sense. I came back to Victoria on the ferry, and then I started that group where it was me and another person. But people were wanting to know more history, and so was I. So I did research. The first book, it was a photocopy of a book. It wasn't even the real book from 1903, 1903. That's like a hundred years ago. Written about law of attraction. I, that was photocopied and I went through it. It was really hard to read. It was one of those old, you know, everything was uh, spoken in the male tense and using really bizarre words and the word vibration. And it was pretty interesting. Then the next book was 1913. So there was a big gap. Uh, and then there was a few more, but not very much. It felt like it was gone for about 30 years. And then in the, er the late 80s, early 90s, Abraham Hicks was another group that started to talk about law of attraction and they brought it to the forefront. They brought up a lot of attention, which started a big underground community of people that love them and follow the work. So there's not a lot of history on it, but there is evidence of, one book was called Law of Attraction and Thought Vibration. I think that one was 1911 or something like that. I can get it in my closet, but some really old teachings. Yeah, and I, then I of course- a, a lot of these tie, oh, I'm sorry. A, lo okay. a lot of these tie uh, to um, Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich, which Napoleon Hill got a lot of his ideas from um, uh, w Wallace uh, Waddles, The Science yeah. of Getting Rich. I think that was 1907 or 17. And I, I, I recently read that for the first time. I think mm -hmm. he did use that terminology in here. Now, Rex Sykes, he's an authority on like this subject right here. He knows, he knows the history of all this. So I, I defer to him sometimes. He was on the show. Um, oh, yeah. He said that this Atkinson guy, like you know, supposedly was, you know, one of the ones that started this, like I think in the late 1800s, maybe even 1850. And all those books stem back from him because there was this sort of, um, this big thing going on around around that time of law of you know not law of attraction per se but mind mindset ideas yeah it was it was a it was an out there subject right 
mindset yeah. and thinking positive and making money on your own. I mean, that was so foreign, those ideas. But yeah, and uh, even the latest group, Abraham and the Ud, they're actually channeling information. So it comes from different places. The truth is there's only one answer to law of attraction, but it's how it's taught. And the answer is you get what you vibrate, period. Now, how you teach it, whether you use apples or oranges or three-step processes or uh, love stories or whatever it is, the answer is always the same. You get what you vibrate. And because of that, my job was to teach people how to do this, how to change their vibe so they get different results, right? Again, it's the how-to. How do I do this differently? How do I change my vibe? What do I say? What do I do? What do I think about? Thank you, Michael. Yep. That was brilliant. All right, bro, uh, Mike, Michael, uh, next question. So this is sort of uh, an extension of what we're talking about. In every moment, we're constantly attracting or repelling other people into our lives. First, do you agree or disagree with that? And then I thought about this. Is there really, is there possibly a third option, a neutral option? Like at any moment, maybe we're not repelling or attracting. Maybe we're just like standing out, standing still. We're, no, nah, I don't want to attract, but I don't want to repel. I'm, I'm neutral. Yeah. Is that possible? Well, I don't understand the repelling thing. Okay. We're not repelling anything. We're just attracting. By repelling, you might mean you're not giving that attention, so you're not attracting that. Right. In other words, I might be repelling. It's a funny word when you say it over and over. I might be repelling negative people, but I'm not really repelling them. I'm just attracting the positive ones. So in my world, you can say that without repelling anything, because to try to repel something causes you to do what? It causes you to give attention to what you're trying to repel. So right. you're not really repelling. You're actually giving it attention. It's like when people say something negative, say, cancel that. <laughs> Saying cancel just includes it. It's like, oh, cancel that thought that I didn't want to include in my bubble. Cancel that negative thought. So canceling actually includes it. So instead of saying you're repelling something, just say I'm, I'm attracting this all the time. And what you're attracting is either negative or positive, And there's not one in the middle. And a lot of our attraction has to do with our observations. What am I paying attention to with my eyes or with my ears? And what am I learning? What am I listening to? I know that you know that you, we could scan a, the clubhouse rooms and our vibrational meter, this is our vibrational meter right here. Our vibrational meter reader is really our feelings. Like you can be str strong negative vibes or strong positive. And, you know, we go into clubhouse on high vibe. We can look at a club, I can look at a clubhouse room and my dial goes, e I'm not, I don't even go in the room and I can feel that. Yeah. And then like, I don't go in a negative room because it influences my vibration. Hearing even a title keeps me off. Even a title of the room can lower my vibration. So I'm pretty good at being selfish. And selfish means self-care. I care about my own vibe so much so that I don't go in. I rarely go into rooms. I went into yours because I knew who you were and so on. But I rarely go into a room if it's not mine because I'm so protective of my vibration. Matter of fact, my only job is to mind my vibration. I've done a lot of work to get high on the dial. Why would I lower it for somebody else or another room? And the reason why we want to have a high dial is... The speed at which we attract the things that we want isn't determined by how much we want them. It's determined by how much negativity we have that's diluting the desire. So on this hand, I say I want it. On this hand, I have a negative doubt about it. This doubt cancels the desire and the net effect is zero. Mm. You know, and the best way to become more positive, this is, the, this is a formula. The best way to become more positive is to become less negative. That's how you become more positive. Our natural state is already positivity. We don't have to get more positive. We just have to reduce the negativity. Imagine like a lotus flower, all the, all the mucky leaves. The, the flower is already beautiful. You just got to get rid of this negative leaf and this negative leaf. So as you're, as you're peeling back the negative experiences, your natural, your natural vibration surfaces, I'll say it again, to become more positive, you need to become less negative. And the way to become less negative is to eliminate and delete these three words. And here's everybody's homework. Whenever you catch yourself using the word don't, not, and no, here is the corrective sentence. So what do I want? Don't forget. What do you want? Remember. Don't spill your milk. So what do you want? Drink your milk carefully. I don't want my clients to cancel. What do I want? I want this here is the mother of all reset sentences. 
you want to reset the vibe you're giving about anything, how do you reset a vibe? With this sentence. Because when you go from what you don't want to what you do want, the words change. Mm -hmm. And then when the words change, the vibration changes. And law of attraction doesn't know what the vibration used to be. It's responding to the vibration that you're sending right now. This is so important that people get it. You have the ability to change your vibe by changing what you're talking about, what you're reading, what you're writing, what you're remembering, what you're paying attention to, what clubhouse room you go in. And use your vibrational meter reader to help you decide. That's brilliant. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate that. That's a very great share. Michael, let's talk about the secret for a second. What is, what is the secret that the film The Secret refers to? Now, before you answer that question, Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich, I'm part of a 13 series book, uh, book series that I'm writing right now with uh, Eric Swanson, and it's called The 13 Steps to Riches. Every one of the steps in Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich, we're writing okay. a book on. Okay. And his steps, you know, go from persuasion, um, I'm sorry, uh, persistence, et cetera. But the main idea, um, the, the, they say is that he was talking about believing it, it, you know so going back to the question and, and maybe it's a connection to napoleon hill's supposedly secret believing what is the secret of the film the secret refers to well, the secret is definitely referring to law of attraction claiming you know it's a marketing to call it a secret because everybody wants to know a secret what is the secret to attracting positive things right well, it's not a secret. It's called the law of attraction. So that was definitely a marketing strategy that worked out really well for them. So as people were learning about it, they were saying, well, this is law of attraction. So we, I love the secret for doing that. It gave, the, it, it gave worldwide exposure to the subject. Here was the good part. It didn't do a good job telling people how to apply it. In other words, it was stories. This person attracts this. This person put a check on the ceiling. And they were sure it was so well produced. It was believable because people said, wow, that's when people say that's happened to me before that's buy-in. I don't care what the skeptics think that's happened to me before I attracted something within a day. So it was really easy to get people and people were so pumped up, but they didn't know how to apply it. Well, what do I do now? Meanwhile, Michael Loge's seminar turned into a book it was already published for those years. So people were buying my book as the companion book to The Secret. Matter of fact, after I sold it my, to my publisher in 37 languages, she came back and she said, we have some US publishers. Meanwhile, I hadn't sold the English rights. I was pretty satisfied at this point selling it. And it was all the foreign rights one. And she said, we've got three people that want to interview you. And uh, the first one wanted me to change the cover and add information about The Secret in it. So I turned that down for a million dollars. I said, no. Wow. And then I had another publisher that wanted me to uh, make it bigger and include reference. Everybody was jumping on the secret bandwagon. And I turned that offer down. And then I met the third publisher. Well, even before I met them, I told my agent, zero changes, period, nothing. So I met with the publisher. You know, they, they knew I sold a lot of books. They had access that I didn't have, right? They knew I was selling thousands of books a week and but I did negotiate one change the original book law of attractions in yellow and the published book it's in white how flexible was I <laughs> I was so flexible and the book is 20 years old and every year they say do you want to change anything the only thing I ever changed was this the mustache picture Dr. <laughs> Phil picture uh, and then last year my agent said you know what my book, my, I'm still getting royalty checks. It's 20 years old and it's selling really well. And they're, they're reprinting it like every three or four months. Sometimes, it, you know, uh, you know, Andy Frisella, he has a, a podcast. When he mentions, he loves my book too. He's a big alpha dude. So when he talks about my book, I'm selling thousands wow. of books when he talks about my book. So my publishers, one time people are emailing me saying, I can't find your book anywhere. It's not on Amazon. So then I called the, my publisher and I said, can you check what's going on? And, and after about a day, they came back and said, they're backlogged. They have like 800 orders for your book and, we, and we're shipping them from the warehouse. So we love, we love that kind of news. Huh. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. So I did negotiate one change and I did do that. So now I don't even sell my books myself. Um, people just buy them on Amazon or I bring them to seminars too. 
Yeah, and you got over like 2,000 reviews on Amazon. Is that just all natural? Like you, you didn't yeah. have anything no, to do with that? Nothing. I never did wow. any of that. Yeah, That's over 2,000 reviews. And the people that don't like it, they're not giving me a book review. They're right. giving me a subject review. <laughs> I'll say law of attraction is full of you know what. Well, that's not reviewing the book. Right, right. But you know what? I like to see the the, the one stars it for anything because I'm always thinking, oh, what kind of mood were they yeah, in feedback. when they wrote? Yeah, it's just <laughs> feedback. And the, and some people said there's too much white space, and other people said, oh, I love the white space. So, whatever. Can't please them all. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Next question. Thank you, Michael. To be great. Should the mind be stronger than our feelings? Should our mind be stronger than our feelings? Hmm, I don't even know if that's possible. The feelings will always take over. You know, I say I want to do something and the feeling of fear comes up or insecurity, so I don't get it done. I say I want to create something and then I have insecurity or creative blocks. So I think the mind can, has the idea and then the feelings is what stops us or, or moves us forward. So. So for example, Michael, like if, you, if you're not feeling good, you don't want to get out of bed, right? Yeah. Your mind is telling you, get out of bed. Come on. Like, I'm not feeling well. Let's get out of bed. We got to do something. But the body's feeling horrible and saying, no, stay in. So you stay in. Yeah. But what, you know, at a certain point, shouldn't the, shouldn't the mind uh, take over the, the feelings and say, look, we got to get out of bed so we can do yeah, something. Yeah, well, it's a loop. You know, I remember one time I went to Peru, all the way to Peru, a 17 hour flight. And I was, I got so sick. They had to call um, medical help to come to, you know, and I was sweating so bad. And I was on stage in four hours. And they said, well, we're just we're not going to be able to do it. And meanwhile, I'm at the hotel. I'm looking across the street and they had the whole side of the building is four keynote speakers and one of them's me. Wow. My greater, and it took up the whole side of this massive hotel. And I thought, what, Michael's sick? Oh, Michael's sick, he can't come. So I just said, and so then I had to take over. And so, you know, to me, having a shower changes everything. Shower, fresh haircut, fresh shave. And I get out and I was a little sweaty and I said, oh my God. And I just, and I just convinced myself, I got to the event, I was a massive superstar. And I had, I had 2000 people repeat after me everything I said for one hour presentation. It was magical. And then afterwards it was all the hugging and shaking and pictures. And then I got back to the hotel and I slept like until I left. I literally slept until the next day. So I was able to bracket, you know what I mean by that? Say, you know what, you're not feeling good. Just put that over off to the side and do, your, do a job. So yeah, there's a fighting between the mind and. Um, so I, I think you kind of agree with that question because you to be great, like you and successful as you were, your mind had to override your feelings. Your mind had to be stronger than your feelings and say, "Look, rise up. We got stuff to do. Get out of bed." Yeah, I, I, like if, yeah, I would say that a lot, particularly if I had to, <laughs> if I had to make phone calls. You know, you know, I'd go through the newspaper in Victoria and said, "Hey, you know, this sales group meets every Friday at the Empress Hotel." I mean, I didn't know anything about the business, but. And I'd have to, and then I would say, don't do it. A little voice said, well, who's going to do it for you? <laughs> you know, you know, you don't have anybody just do it. Do, if you feel the fear and do it anyway. And there was a lot of times I was part of mastermind teams and a mastermind team is good because everybody on that team has more courage for me than I do for, they have more courage for me than I have for myself. So when I said, I remember saying, you know what, I'm going to call three hotels and I was so nervous and everybody said, oh, you know what? They're going to love to hear from you. They need your business, right? <laughs> so the team would help me change my mind about that. So I think we opened up the show by saying, I'd like to do things with other people because other people, I have more courage for you than you for yourself, not you particularly, but so I like the other people and said, of course you can do that. Give her a call. And I was like, really? So yeah. it's good to have a team member or somebody on your team that's supporting each other. That's why I like the mastermind team model. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate that. Great response. Michael, uh, next question, maybe just a minute or so. You already touched upon this, but if we can just dive into this a little bit more. When yeah. you delete somebody's bad emotions, okay, where does it go? Like, you know, the thing that you've done for me where you're deleting yeah. bad emotions, where's it going? Well, the emotion is the size of a baseball and it's called an unprocessed emotion. So you know how sometimes we might get ticked off or embarrassed or maybe we were embarrassed about something. And we thought, oh, I'm not telling anybody about this. And we held it in. But yet, however, that little emotion comes up with us. You can, oh my God, I remember years ago. And that feeling from that emotion, we still have it. And it's called an unprocessed emotion, similar to the chart here. 
So that feeling is like a pimple and it arises. And that's what we say, oh, I'm feeling angry. It's literally a ball of energy called anger. So I'm able to, on my client's behalf, is delete that ball of energy so they don't feel it again. I know it sounds bizarre for people that have these jealousy triggers or anger issues or rage. It's one emotion that causes it every time. And it's like a pimple. You know how when that pimple goes away and says, oh, good, the pimple's gone. And it comes back from the same spot. Well, that's what emotions are. This anger trigger is this baseball-sized emotion. I have a unique ability to connect with the client and then delete it with a magnet. And the magnet is the only thing that can delete emotions. And then people try to feel and think, I can't feel it. I can't even get angry. It's because you don't have the emotion of anger anymore. I deleted it. And my Saturday show that I do once a month, I've done 250 episodes. Wow. My friend John and I, we do it together. Why? Because it's my strategy. <laughs> so him and I do it together and we bring two people on and we're healing their chronic pain live during a Facebook show. And we do that once a month, the first Saturday of the month. And pain, physical pain, emotion is caused by emotions that can be deleted by a magnet. It's pretty bizarre and out there, but so am I. I've always been different. <laughs> you know, my whole life, I was always at the forefront. Law of attraction 20 years ago. And then there was EFT. And then there was, you know, your life purpose. I'm always seemed to be at the front of that. And then enrolling people into it. So same with deleting negative emotions. It's a new subject. But in another five years, it's going to be tipped over for the world's going to understand that they can delete all the negative emotions that they're feeling or have did, someone do it for them. Did you study, um, Rex always talks about this, neuro-linguistic? Yes, NLP, it stands for neuro-linguistic yeah. programming. Yeah, yeah I'm, a, I'm a practitioner of that, and, um, NLP practitioner. Neuro meaning the brain, right. linguistics meaning words, and P for programming. So earlier when I was saying to delete, delete the words don't, not, and no, so what I was doing was I was programming this experience. So this is the NLP. This is oh, this is NLP. Program. When you do that, that's that's what yeah. NLP. That's what they're talking. That's about. right. Because I'm helping the student learn by addressing their style. So NLP. Remember these words. That's the programming part. The, the words are the linguistic part. And Rex, according to Rex, it came out like in the seventies or something. Uh, yeah, NLP. it's not super too old, you know. And there's a couple lead people, and there's lots of trainers. Lots of business people use it. It's really about how to communicate better and how to stay in rapport with people, right? And, and how to influence people in a positive way. You know, people plant seeds and they don't mean to, you know? Here's an example of an NLP scent. You might say, oh, you're gonna take um, Bob's seminar? Oh God, I got so many good results from it. You're gonna love it. So in NLP, I'm actually paving your experience. You're gonna love Bob's seminar. And people say, oh, you're gonna take Bob's seminar? Oh my God, class three drove me crazy. It went on forever. <laughs> so now I'm installing that experience about class three. So that's that's not a so that's how people are using, not using NLP. They're saying things that are installing the idea, but with NLP, very deliberate about moving people to the future, which is what I do. Are we a robot? What does that mean? Uh, like are we, are we like when you when you talk about installing, downloading, it, it, it sounds like we're like we're sort of similar to robots or, or like okay. computers, right? Yeah, well, it could be that way. You know, sometimes I smell something and it brings back a memory. That's very robotic, right? right, right. Or sometimes I hear a song, it reminds me of an old date that I had when I was younger. <laughs> Everything is stored, right? And uh -huh. that is stored in these file folders that we're experiencing. Thank you, Michael. Michael, next question. How powerful is a thought? Well, it created everything. Everything starts with the thought. You see, the thought is a vibration. When I think about, so, you know, when I talk about thoughts, anytime I think about something, it causes me to give it attention. So it's not really the thought that attracts it. It's what am I giving attention to? So if I'm thinking about clients counseling and I remember two days, not really, but two days ago, I had a client counsel and then there was Betty two weeks ago. If I'm giving attention to client counseling, then my vibration is client counsels. And that law of attraction will bring me more of that. So yeah. definitely, it's what am I giving attention to? Everything is included. Whether I'm watching it, reading it, writing it, listening to it, remembering something positive, remembering something negative, worrying, complaining, observing, 
making a collage, doing a dream board, reading, you know, in my, my book after 20 years is, is coming out with five new chapters. It, they're making it an anniversary issue. And one of the new chapters, which will date the book because this didn't exist when I wrote the book was how social media impacts your vibration. Very relevant now, didn't exist when I wrote my book, but how does it? And remember earlier, I was showing you the vibrational meter reader. It's like, you can tell by your vibration. What, what you're thinking, I've got one of these, you do. You know what it is, it's your feelings. This is a feeling meter. <laughs> You can tell by your feelings whether you should go in that room or not, or have this conversation. You're already doing it with when you're eating something. If it's too spicy, you don't keep eating it. They can, oh, and then you make a decision, get something different. So we have to use this more to help us make decisions. If it feels good, it is. If it doesn't, it isn't. If, if people in Clubhouse only really got what you said, they, they wouldn't be in the, the newsrooms or the, the negative rooms, or just mm -hmm. talking about crazy stuff there's a lot of people in here too like yeah. thousands of well, people yeah well i have a reputation in my people that come to my room are on my vibration right right just like you, you know people come in they peek they hear they hear the word the vibration they leave it's okay i don't get offended because i can't match everybody i can't match everybody here's here's the dial right there's these people the negative they got low <laughs> vibration and high I like i like to hang out here yeah. So when people come into my room and they don't stay, it's because, and I'm not judging them. I know we're not on a vibration because we're not matching. And I want to show you my motto. Remember that I'm a trainer and I like to use visuals. This is, this is my motto. Matches. <laughs> These are matches. That's law of attraction. Matches. If I'm talking to a potential client and we're not a match, it's okay. I can't match everybody. Even my friends... If my friends are down here and they're in a bad mood, they don't call me until they get here because they'll know I'll raise their vibration. You think my friends call to complain to me? No. You know what most of my friends say? I always have to watch what I say when I talk to you. And you know what I say? You're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome. I always have to plan my conversation so I'm more positive with you. And I say, well, you're welcome. And then most of, and then some of my friends say this, you're the most uplifting person in my life. And that's literal. It means if you're going to play in my sandbox, you're going to have to raise your vibration from 40 to the high 90s. So when they say you're the most uplifting person, it means I literally uplifted them from a lower vibration to match mine. And Michael. sometimes you can turn, oh, you can tick people off. I can <laughs> tick people off. And because because when people are complaining, they're always saying this. Oh, I don't like this when they're worrying. And then I always say this. So what do you want? Yeah, but yeah, but yeah, but no. So what do you want? And then, and then it makes them reset. And they say, okay, well, here's what I want instead. And then they've reset their vibe. So I influence them. They'll find somebody else to buy into that negative story. Not me. Mm -hmm. And my friends know that. They say, if I'm going to call Michael, he's going to let me complain for 15 seconds. Then he's going to say this. So what do you want? So, so Michael, on that point, like when people do that, what they're actually trying to do is influence you to buy into their negative feelings and make you feel the same way they feel. Misery truly loves company. Oh, yes. I mean, that's, but isn't it, it it's so accepting that somebody can come into a group and be negative and people would accept it. And then I come in and I'm positive and I'm the weird one. <laughs> you know, when I was the project manager, I would have a team of five or six people. It only took one person to influence that meeting in a negative way. And it only took one person to influence it. So it was me. You know, I had a sign in my office that said, behind every complaint is a request. And people would tilt their heads. They didn't know what that meant. That was before the days of law of attraction. You know, uh, uh, um, it's too hot in here. So what do you want? Uh, can you turn up the heat? <laughs> this is too slow. So every complaint, this, is, this will help you reset it. So even Michael, back when I worked in the government, I was teaching people how to reset their words. I, I, I agree with you 100%. Like managing the rooms of Clubhouse, you can see this actually happen. As soon as somebody says something negative or like tries to redirect the conversation in, in, yeah. in a negative vibe, it just drops a lot. Yeah. And if they keep going, I mean, you can, you can cut a room in half in like two minutes. So Yeah. Well, you know what? I stink sometimes in my own room. I can sting people. And then I had people email me and say, oh my God, you handled that masterfully, thank you. Because <laughs> if it's annoying me, it's annoying other person. 
some people want to go on with their story too much. And I said, no, no more story. Yeah, but yeah, but no, no more story. Tell me what you want instead. So I sting a bit, but people love me at the end. Well, most people, some people. Thank you, Michael. Michael, next question. Now, the, the book, Think and Grow Rich, has changed the movement in uh, self-help industry a lot with Napoleon Hill. Can you really think and grow rich, as Napoleon Hill was trying to say, where you basically, you think the, the right things and you can grow rich? Uh, now, one of the things that Don Green, who was interviewed on here, he's the CEO of Napoleon Hill, he said, when they say think and grow rich, the grow rich means action has to happen. That's why it's saying grow rich. There's an action here. Yeah. Well, can you really think, change your mind to think and then attract? Because there's a law of attraction built in that question, right? Yeah. Well, if I was going to rewrite the way that's presented, it isn't, and, I'm, and I love the book, so this is my interpretation, right? It's not think and grow rich. It's include the vibration and go rich. Because law of attraction is responding to what you think about that. So if you think, you know, the affirmation, money comes to me easily. Well, that's a positive thought. But what if it doesn't? And the little void, the real use is, well, money doesn't come. I've been struggling with money. So law of attraction isn't responding to what you're thinking about. It's responding to how you feel about what you're thinking about. So you can think and grow rich if your thoughts are congruent with the feelings, but sometimes they're not. So the job is to include the vibration of being rich. But I don't even use the word rich or money because it has a negative conversation. Most people, just the word money is ain't, ain't, not enough. I don't have any, I'm not worthy. Money, like all that BS. I use the word abundance. So in my programs, I teach people how to become more abundant. And here's the secret to that is that abundance is a feeling. Money's not a feeling, although it creates one. So what if, let's do a little hack. What if I was sending the vibration of abundance and law of attraction was eavesdropping and caught me sending the vibration of abundance. And then it would unfold and orchestrate to match the vibration that I was sending about abundance. The only way to become abundant is to send the vibration of it. It's not my rule, it is the law. So if you want to become more abundant, then you need to send the vibration of abundance. And abundance is a feeling. And I can make you feel anything. People say, no, you can't. I can make you feel ticked off right now with your feelings. I can make you feel jealous. I can make you feel angry. I can make you feel embarrassed. My point is, pick a feeling and I can make you feel it. And because abundance is a feeling, I can make you feel it. So for the friends watching today, here is how you can declare your abundantness. And when you declare and notice your abundantness, this causes you to send the vibration of abundance and the only way to attract it. Listening today, you can say, wow, that was like a two hour masterclass today. Look at the notes I had talking to Michael. I, boy, is this ever abundant? I got a free course. You can put a price on it. You can say, I just got a $99 training from Michael Loge. How abundant am I? And law of attraction doesn't know you're celebrating the free training with you and I. It's responding to how you feel about when you notice that you're, you're abundant. Now, how can, I, how can I build on the abundance vibration? I would say this to people. Uh, okay, in a seminar, raise your hand. How many people, somebody bought you coffee in the last two days? Okay, great. Well, you guys are abundant. Did you know that? And most people say, well, I thank them. Don't just thank them. Tell the story and say, wow, am I ever abundant? Dr. Anthony just bought me a coffee and bought me lunch. And while I was having lunch with him, he gave me free advice. I got free advice. I got free coffee and I got free lunch. And he picked me up and drove me there. Am I ever abundant? That's like a $400 lunch I had with him. And I didn't pay a thing. Am I ever abundant? I can't wait to talk about it. The more that I remember about my abundantness and how do I do that? Everybody pay attention. I have to seek it with my little man. Oh, there's abundance here and here, free lunch and free drive and free advice. Oh, look at me. I got my 10th coffee for free. Oh, I got 40% off. Oh, I got a free hotel. If you become a seeker of all the things that you could claim to be abundant, every time you seek it, you include it. And the only way to get is, so be deliberate. That's why it's called deliberate attraction. Be deliberate to notice your abundance. And when you're doing that, you include it. Now, it could be because I live on the street and I see people parking and they go to put money on the meter and I see sound and say, hey, no, they're doing, oh my God, I got and they go on and on. Yeah, they got like 25 cents on the meter. 
Law of attraction doesn't know it's 25 cents. Law of attraction is responding to your enthusiasm about your attraction to find a media with money on it. So be deliberate and notice things that are abundant. Start a log today. Free coffee, free lunch, a free report, free training, free advice, 20% off here. The truth is a lot of you, including me and you, we're already, that's already happening, but we're not exaggerating it. It's like a muscle. So spend more time to say, wow. And even if you spend a minute, listen, a minute of including your abundantness in your vibration is better than how many minutes? Say it when you know it, zero. So what if law of attraction, while it was eavesdropping on my vibration, caught me sending the vibration of abundantness. It does, hey, why is Michael sending? It doesn't know who Michael is. It doesn't know why I'm sending it. It is matching the vibration perfectly. So Michael, to go back to the original question, you think maybe it could have been worded better by calling it feel and grow rich? Feel and grow rich. You could say that, yeah. But it's all slice and dice. The thought causes me to have a feeling. Right. Right. And I think that uh, the F word is not as friendly as the T word, <laughs> right? Like thinkers, you know, that's, and that's, and I'm going to be general here, but I think that might appeal to a broader audience, particularly men. I'm saying that being judgmental or my own experience. It's important to say feelings. You got to talk about your feelings. You got to get a feeling for it. That's kind of a, that's kind of a myth too. Yeah, so it doesn't matter the words you say. I mean, the feelings is the most important thing. Yeah, law of attraction doesn't know what you're thinking or reading or writing. It's responding to how you feel about all those things. All right, thank you, Michael. Appreciate it. Michael, we got uh, a few more temple questions. We'll figure about 30 seconds each, and then we'll wrap it up. Okay, it. let's do it. All right, ready? So here we go. Can one book change the world? 30 seconds. Uh, I think, yeah, I think books have done that. Not that I subscribe to it, but the Bible certainly changed the world. Um, other important books changed the world. I've influenced over 4 million people and they probably influenced other people. So yeah, influencing is a good word. Thank you, Michael. Next question. What role has networking played in your life? There maybe 30 seconds. Networking. Uh, I'm not a good networker. Like when I would go to a trade show to network, I would bring somebody with me so I wasn't by myself because I'm awkward. I'm awkward if I'm not on stage. I'm not a good networker. But if it's my event, I'm like a peacock in a Santa suit. <laughs> but if I'm at somebody else's event or a house party, I'm pretty mousy and I'm quiet. So I'm either on or I'm off. So I'm not a good networker. I am if I'm in a booth at a trade show, then I network. But to approach people, I'm a little shy. But when people, you know, because I bring this to a trade show, it brings a lot of attention, right? So it's easier for me to network if people are coming to me. But has like certain people in your life made major help you to, to, to cross bridges, so to speak, to get as successful as you were? Like if you deleted those people, for example, they wouldn't have improved your life. Would you agree with that? Oh, yeah. There's been significant people. Uh, some of these people are, uh, you know, I have a hypnotherapist friend. I have, you know, I, I have friends that use tech. You know, I've used techniques that I just couldn't find other resources, mostly to change my mind about stuff or get rid of my doubt about stuff. That's usually what stops us from moving forward is insecurity and doubt. So I would work on those kind of things. Thank you, Michael. Next question. Uh, uh, is mentoring important? And who are some of your mentors? Maybe 30 seconds. OK, yeah, mentoring is important. I'm a mentor to a lot of people. And uh, sometimes it's just being available to answer questions. Mentors are important because they have more courage for us than we do for themselves. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Michael. Michael, next question would be important to ask you on this uh, podcast. What are your favorite financial books, if any? Now, I include investing, money, wealth, business, if any. Uh, I don't Maybe have any. Here. Yeah. I have, I have 10 books in my house. Three of them are mine. So <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> seven or outside. I don't even have a bookshelf in my house. Thank you, Michael. All right, Michael, uh, do we need money to survive? Maybe 20 seconds. Yeah, for sure. I think we need money to survive. You know, it helps create freedom. And uh, yeah, I love money. I think it's important. And I earn it and I deserve it. And it's important for me to be able to do the things that I want. So yeah, money's an exchange of energy. And it's a reflective, you know, can I raise my price? Can I ask for this? So there's a lot of emotions around money. Next question, Michael, is finance necessary for everyone? I'm talking about the subject of finance. Uh, oh, yes, I think for sure. You know, the, you know I, I, was, I wasn't a business person. I worked for the government, so I had a fixed income and, 
And then when I start working on my own, I was thinking, oh my God, I just made a thousand dollars. So that was all never had money. And, and, you know, I grew up with parents that had this, my dad had the same job for 40 years. And my mother had, she was, had a little hairdresser studio at the back of her house, you know? So I never heard my parents talk about money ever in my entire life. We never heard a money conversation because my mom had her own and my dad was, you know, traditional hardworking dad come home, and his money looked after. So my mother wanted something. So they never thought about money, never talked about it. And so I didn't understand about money too much. So when I had a lot of it, it was like, wow, I mean, I just don't have to work paid. So it was all brand new to me. You know, then I invested in properties and, you know, I, I wish I had done it earlier and sooner. And of course, it'd be nice if people taught this in school, you know. Thank you, Michael. Three more questions left. What, uh, how important is having a purpose in business uh, relating to your third book? And what is your purpose, if you can say it in like one or two sentences? Well, it's pretty easy. I'm going to show you a target. Remember, in all three of my books, I have a signature presentation. That's the target right there. The target is to feel good. The target is joy. And the real question is, well, what brings me joy? What does make me feel good? And the outside circles is, well, you've got to create things to make you feel good. And the real question is, well, I don't know what makes you feel good. So the outside says, identify your fulfillment needs. So earlier I told you what fulfills me. And then when I know what fulfills me, I create strategies to get them met. So when you said, Michael, would you like to do this and this and this? I went to my list and yes, yes, yes. So I create things to get them met. And when they're not met, everybody knows this, we say we're bored. I'm so bored. And what we're really saying is I'm not fulfilled. So be selfish enough to create strategies to get your own needs met. So what, what would your purpose be if you can say it in one sentence? Well, my purpose is to feel good, but my strategies are to feel, you know, to influence people, freedom, and, you know, intimate conversations, attention, attentiveness. So all of those, wrap, I know it's a different concept, right? The whole notion that that's our purpose, because people say, well, no, my purpose is to be a singer or a dancer or to be an actor or to be an author. I said, no, that's not your purpose. That's your strategy to get your needs met. What is the real need that gets met behind? So our life purpose, in my opinion, isn't the job. It's what feelings get met. People say, oh no, my job's to be a singer. And I say, well, what, how do you feel when you sing? I say, oh my God, I have so much freedom and I'm in. So then they tell me how they feel when they're singing. So that's why you like to sing. So it's a little bit of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A little bit of, um, uh, when, uh, oh, I almost had it. Uh, a shift, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, oh, I can't think of it right now. I'm like a mind shift to it's say- It's a different paradigm. A paradigm that's the what i'm looking for the paradigm shift is your purpose is to feel good and the real question is well what makes me feel good and then when i uncover that i'll do more of it so having a poor, uh, purpose is important you're saying for sure oh yeah it's a, it's okay. focus it's target even you know the friends that i work with that you know they would say they're depressed or they're in most case well in all cases it's because they don't have a goal <laughs> they don't have a plan and all through COVID everybody was having these emotions because they didn't have a plan they didn't plan anything for the future they didn't look forward to anything so you got to have a plan you got to have a goal and it keeps changing you know you got to be you got to address and say at one time at one time my goal was to do have two clients well I got that now my goal is different so <laughs> the goal keeps growing and changing thank you Michael you're doing brilliant two more questions life what would you what would you like to do in the next 10 years or so why okay I'd, I'd like to be feeling as good as or better than I do now. <laughs> and I, it doesn't matter to me how it unfolds, right? As long as it's delivered that way. Honestly, when I turned 60, I thought I was, I thought, I thought, you know what, it's time to wind down. You know, I had a great life. I traveled the world, you know, I can just sit home and do that. And I, then I submit, I don't want to travel anymore. It's a big deal. COVID, all that stuff is, and I'm not going to travel. And then I got on Clubhouse about a year ago. And then I rejuvenated my whole career because I love the subject so much and I found a way to do it. And I get all of those foreign needs met. So um, I didn't know I'd be doing more audio stuff, but at the end of the day, this is happening. So, and I do more of it. Any movies or you maybe plan on making a movie, more books? No, no more books. I do have a lot of information. You know, my very first book, it's not really a book, but you know, uh, when I was working for the government, a friend of mine, we used to produce a, a, a trade show. This was 25 years ago and it was called the Holistic Health Expo. 
And because I'm a trainer, I'd be helping all the exhibitors. So it's not available anymore, but the very first thing, this is how entrepreneurial I was. I wrote a little booklet. It was called 110 Tips and Strategies for Successful Trade Show Exhibiting. 111. 100, yeah, 111. It fit in a number 10 envelope uh -huh. and cost 47 cents to produce. And I sold them for $8.99. <laughs> Why? Because there was no book with the title. So this would fit on a number 10 envelope. So, uh, and then, uh, you know, and then it wasn't part of my brand anymore. But you can see I've always been a trainer, whether it was training people how to be an exhibitor. I also do uh, some clubhouse events, helping authors that want to plan their book. And I teach the strategy that I do, starting with the cover. I did the cover of these books first, the very first thing I did. Now, this one got changed a bit, but it didn't matter. I was still networking it for two years. So when the book came out, it wasn't a surprise. I was networking it. My other little strategy is I do a business card with the book cover on the front and on the back, encourages them to go to my website wow. to find out more about it. So I handed out. 10,000 of these while I was doing seminars. We would bring a box of these and everybody would get it. And then it'd go to the website and be notified. So when the book came out, you know, and that's why it's important. I did the cover first and then I was able to um, um, take advantage of having the cover. That's a brilliant strategy. Mike, you're, you're a great entrepreneur too. You, you've had a lot of great entrepreneurial uh, tendencies and that's why you're so successful. Michael, last question. What would you like to be your legacy in this world? Maybe 20 seconds. Uh, th this right here. I like to think that I created this phenomena, the vibe reset button. <laughs> I've been talking about it for 22 years and I was in Malaysia uh, doing a seminar once and I, my Malaysian team, they were brilliant, right? Um, and we just, they, you use the word vibe, re vibe a lot to reset your vibes. And, you know, in Malaysia, you can get anything done. And so they took me to a place that had made these little buttons. And they said, we can get 10,000 of these printed overnight. And I was in Malaysia for 28 days. So we got these made and then every participant in the seminar would wear it. So uh -huh. everybody would wear the pin. And then I remember going to big conferences like Clubhouse, but real conferences. And I'd have, a, I'd have my knapsack, a bag of these. And people come and say, oh, Michael Loja, because I'd have a name tag. Michael Loja, I love your book. And it was like dog treats. <laughs> I'd reach into my bag and I would say, would you like a vibe reset button? <laughs> so then they would go tell their friends. And remember I said, I'm not good at networking, but here's what would happen. Strangers were coming up to me and said, hey, my friend Anthony said, you've got some reset buttons. Can I get a reset button, Mr. Loja? <laughs> so people were coming up to me to get one of these little fabulous reset buttons. I don't have any left, so don't ask anybody, but <laughs> the whole notion, what an important tool. I, I stressed it today. You have the ability to reset your vibe. And when you change your vibe, you change your results. When you change your vibe, you change your results. Well, Mike, I, well, make, I, wanna, ahead, I'm I just wanna make one quick point because I wanna make sure. sure everybody gets it. I'm not telling people not to be negative. If you've got a negative experience, get ticked off, get angry, break dishes, but you don't want to do it too long. Here's the rule about being negative. Maybe you can read it for our friends. Observe negativity briefly. That's all right. Get pissed off. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to say that. You can cover that up later. Get angry, get ticked Only 10, off, break now. dishes. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> I hate when this happens and scream and swear, and then it gets it out of your system. Uh -huh. But some people will be angry for four days. Well, guess, guess what's eavesdropping while you're angry for four days? So deliberately get ticked off and get it out of your system and say, okay, there, I feel much better. And now you've got a new vibe. See how that works? So, Michael, I'm glad you brought that up because um, I actually forgot to ask you that question. That, that is a beautiful point. Like, we all get angry. We can't, yeah. and we can't delete the words no from our language. Like, no. we, we, have the, we have a use for the words no. Like if you yeah. ask me a question, the answer is no. Like the answer is not yes, it's, it's no. I have to That's say right. no, right? So we yeah. can't delete that. And we can't delete our negativity. That's right. uh, but when we're talking about our goals and dreams and desires, then uh -huh. we don't want to say no. But I can say don't touch. That's not what I mean. When I say, yeah. oh, I don't want clients that are rude or don't want clients that don't have, that's different. But you're right. You, there's times to say don't, not a no. Your voice will still say here, oh, I'm not supposed to use that. But in the right context, it's okay. Yeah, I heard, like, for example, I heard you correcting yourself in a conversation we had last this weekend. 
and you said the word no, and you're like, no, wait, I shouldn't say that. So, I mean, like, <laughs> on a small, small scale, like little moments, you're going to say it. It's going to happen. It's part of the language, but you're That's saying right. in the big context. That's right. right. And I think our overall vibration is the collection of all of that. So to say don't, not, and no here and here, big deal. It gets drowned out with all the other because the stronger vibration wins mm -hmm. the most dumb. So if you're right in the border between negative and positive, and you can just, where's my little, if you're right on the border at 50, then you're, you're, but if you can go to 51, now the balance of your vibration is positive. And then momentum kicks in because you start to attract things that are like it and like it and like it. But the real job is, is not to lower your vibration to go here. And because we have people in our lives that complain, right? They try to bring us down, but now you've got a new way to help them. The next time somebody in your life says what they don't want, you can simply say, so what would you like instead? And now you're protecting your vibration by not buying into the negative conversation and you're influencing them by making them talk about what they want, which causes them to include the vibration of it, which is way better than what they were including. Aren't, aren't there tests for this, Michael, where like you can put, I think something about water, like you can say a word and, and produce a feeling and the water actually changes a different color if you said the opposite and looked at and said it to the water, it, it yes. changes a different color, I, is that true? Yeah, I, I think that's a Chinese uh, author that's written, um, I don't know how to say his name properly, Amodo or something like that, where he does study around energy and words. That's pretty or interesting. Or I've seen it done with plants and stuff. So I know how it makes me feel. So, and I'm pretty <laughs> sensitive. It's like, oh, I don't like the sound of that, or I don't like how that feels. And particularly with Clubhouse, I don't know why I keep going back to that. Because, well, first, I can't believe that a room could have 300 people in it. And they're all arguing. Like, I don't understand the satisfaction. You of and me both. <laughs> I don't get it. It's like, and they're all talking. Like, I went in once because I thought, what? I thought, well, maybe it's just one person. There was like 40 people screaming over each other. And, and why are they not leaving? Like, so I didn't have to have that experience again. But my vibrational meter reader tells me which rooms to go into. I can tell by how I feel. Thank you, Michael. Michael, I'd like to conclude. I want to thank you so much for being here. It was an honor to have you here. Very, very informational. I can't wait to have you on Clubhouse, folks. Um, we just set a date. Uh, tentatively so far, it, it should be October 14th, 2022, in case you're listening to this 20,000 years in the future. Uh, it's October 14th between 7 and 9 p.m. Eastern time. Michael will be in the Finance Club as a main guest speaker. The room will go for about six hours. From about 6, 6.30 roughly to midnight. But Michael will be speaking about two hours, 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern time. So definitely check it out. Michael, before we conclude, any last comments, thoughts, anything else you want to show us? Uh, the floor is yours, Michael. Okay, well, thank you. Well, I would, like, I would like to people to hear the word accountability. And I know that's an ugly word for some people. But when you can be accountable for everything that you're attracting, that is, to me, that is, you've landed. So if you're taking notes, the word accountability equals my ability to account for. So if I'm attracting something positive, like a parking space or a gig or money or Dr. Anthony, when I'm attracting something positive, I can account for that. I'll tell you, this parking space is here because of me. This good contract is here because of me. This opportunity. So when it's something positive, I can account for why I attracted it. I'll tell you so. These things are here because of my vibe. But when it's something negative, what do we say? Well, why am I attracting this? Why is this happening to me? We should be able to say the same thing. This thing that's big and ugly, this is here because of me. You don't have to like it, but you need to own it. And that's what accountability is. When you can say, ooh, this sure is ugly. I wonder what vibe I was sending that caused me to attract that. You don't have to like it, but you need to own it because we can, we can brag about it when it's something positive. So that's the new motto. To summarize everything you heard me say is in the five words. I get what I vibrate, period. Whether you like it or not, or whether it was helpful or not, you get what you vibrate. Thank you, Michael. Michael, where can they find out more information about your, your, uh, your website, maybe your social media as well? We know you're on Clubhouse. Yeah. Yeah, you know, if, if people are enjoying these buttons, these are downloadable, they're just photos, right? And then I upload them to the photo lab. You can go to michaellogier.com forward slash buttons. That's michaellogier.com forward slash buttons. 
There's 10 of them in total. They print off nicely. I put mine on a little cardboard because I touch them 100 times a week. But what a great reminder to have that in your fridge or on your fridge or on your bulletin boards. Oh, good, reminding me. And then the reminder of, this, of all the uh, quotes. So check those out. Oh, you're on mute there. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, what's your website again, Michael? Uh, it is lawofattractionbook.com. So lawofattractionbook.com. Okay. And are you on Instagram, all that stuff too? Yeah, I'm easy to find. Just on Instagram. I'm not on Twitter. You know what? Because Twitter was too negative. And then I would get annoyed when I went to Twitter to see other stuff. And I thought, I got to protect my vibration. So I deleted Twitter. And now I don't have that little negative things of Twitter. Wow. So I'm on Instagram and Clubhouse and Facebook, but mostly Clubhouse and Instagram. Thank you, Michael. So folks, we're going to conclude here. Dr. Anthony created a fourth here. You've been watching the Dr. Finance Live podcast uh, with Michael Lozer as our guest speaker today. So thank you, Michael. Appreciate that. Folks, if you want to get more information, check out drfinance.info. That's the website here. We're going to upload this, uh, download this podcast to um, YouTube and blast out the 20 plus podcast directory. So check it out there. Don't forget to follow, like, and subscribe. And here's my books too. If you if you really want to learn about finance, my three major books, I got the necessity of finance. I wrote that for my finance students over 10, about 10 years ago. And that's, uh, that, that really built into the most important lessons in economics and finance. And then finally the survival of the riches, all my conclusions led up to that about 500 plus page book. So check those books out and let us know, let us know what you're thinking about, about uh, this, this episode here. So appreciate you guys. Appreciate you, Michael. And thanks, folks. We'll see you on the next episode. Bye-bye now.